Hello, welcome to the beautiful Arnhem Space Center. I am Dr. Brad Tucker, and we are here live for quite literally history in the making. We are here for Australia's first commercial launch. We are here for NASA's first commercial launch anywhere in the world. And we are here to change the history of space in Australia. So I'm Dr. Brad Tucker. I will be with you all evening into the night until we see a rocket launch from this facility, heading up to the skies, getting some beautiful data. Now, we are here at the Arnhem Space Center, which is operated by Equatorial Launch Australia. Uh, and we're on the beautiful Yolnu country, the traditional owners of this land that we are quite literally privileged to, to be making this history on this land with the traditional owners, with the history of Australia. And you know, the beautiful thing, I think, about what this moment marks is that space in Australia and astronomy, it didn't start today, it's not gonna to start tonight, it didn't start yesterday. This is something that's been working on for 60,000 years. The traditional people, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have been studying the stars, understanding space, making amazing discoveries that we're just now scratching the surface of for literally millennia. And today we're building on that legacy by seeing Australia's first commercial launch from the Arnhem Space Center. And to start off, we will go um, with a traditional welcome to country from the uh, Yolnu elder, uh, Jawa. And he will show us the beauty of the land, the beauty of the language, and the beauty of where we are right now. That's my mic. Hello everyone, my name is Jawa Yunipingo. I am the chair, uh, chairperson or chairman of Gumaj Corporation and I'm also a traditional owner for this country where Arnhem Space Centre is. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to a country of the Gumaj people. Hello everyone, my name is Jawa Yunipingo. I am the chair, uh, chairperson or chairman of Gumaj Corporation and I'm also a traditional owner for this country where Arnhem Space Centre is. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to a country of the Gumaj people. So just about what's going on where we are right now. Uh, so we will actually talk to Jawa later in the program. So what is happening now? A lot of people are interested. Firstly, when is this rocket taking off? That is the topic, obviously, of everyone's tongue right now. Where is it going to be seen and how? Now, if you don't live in the nearby uh, Arnhem land area near Nolanboy, chances are you're not going to see it. If you live in Darwin, sorry, that's too far west. If you're Queensland, that's too far east. If you're in Canberra, where I'm originally from, or at least living, it's just too cold. So what we're going to have is you have to be in the relative vicinity. We are encouraging people not to come nearby. It is an active facility. You will not be able to get on. If you happen to be in the area, please go outside and take a look safely at your home or wherever you're normally located. The best way to watch, though, is through here. We have cameras that will be in every part of this facility bringing you the live shots. Now, uh, our launch was originally scheduled or 10.44 p.m., that's Australian Central Standard Time, 11.14 Australian Eastern Standard Time. We now are delayed. Now, this delay actually is quite normal. Uh, when we think of delays, uh, we think of always necessarily bad things. 
Delays happen for a number of reasons. Now, one of the comical things right now is this site is beautifully chosen because we're in the dry season of the Northern Territory, yet we've been battling a little bit of rain all throughout the day. So in fact, when you flick to some of the cameras that we'll be seeing later, you may few, see a few raindrops on it. Well, we have rockets, we don't have windscreen wipers, but we'll do the best we can. Um, so far, the winds are dealing accordingly is fine. Now, the other spot about where we are, you will hear other traffic in the background. We are actually in the operations of this rocket center. So we have two buildings operating right now on the Artem Space Center. We have the Launch Control Center, which is just about 150 meters behind us down the road. Now, that control center is where that button will be pressed later tonight that hits go. Where we are here is for the rest of the checks and operations. We have managers um, from Equatorial Launch Australia, representatives from other agencies like the Australian Space Agency, and CASA to make sure everything goes smoothly to plan. So there will be a lot of this traffic going on to make sure this rocket happens. Rockets isn't just about the launch taking place. It's about all of this other stuff happening. Um, so as of now, um, we are about... The current launch we are scheduled is 30 minutes delayed from our original time. So we're currently aiming for a launch at 11.14 p.m. Australian Central Standard Time, 11.44 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So we're only a half hour delayed. What you will see at the hour mark is we will have the countdown displayed on the screen below so you can keep track of when that counting is down, when that rocket is happening. So, as I said, we do have a number of cameras around the site that we will hopefully go to in a second, and you'll get to see where we have. So, this is, this is the main star of the show, so to speak. The scientists may disagree whose payloads are on it. Now, this is a Black Bright 9 rocket. So, this is the thing that's going to be launching later tonight. We will actually go up close and personal, so to speak, with this rocket later this evening with a pre-visit we had last night. This is the magic of television. Now, on this rocket, there is one experiment. It's called the X-ray quantum calimeter. Now, this is run by Dan McCannon and the team at the University of Wisconsin. And so this mission is critical, and we'll talk a little bit about its purpose, to understanding the X-ray light in our galaxy, how it operates. And this is part of a bigger story about why the Arnhem Space Center is here, and that is to see the southern skies. Now, we will have others. Yep, so we're just getting those checks. We've actually just heard that airspace is clear. We're getting an update on the countdown. We are still uh, at that half-hour delay time. So we will be panning to these cameras as we go. Now, the beautiful thing about the Arnhem Space Center is this is an Australian endeavor. Oh, and we're going to go now and hear from Ben, the operations manager of the site. My name's Scott Hi, my name's, uh, I'm ben the Tett, deputy chief for the, the NASA Sounding Rockets uh, Program uh, Office, as well as the Australia 2022 campaign manager. Uh, we're really excited to be here. And, uh, it's been uh, you know, over 10 years in the making uh, to get out here. Uh, it's been over 20 years since we've actually launched from Australia. I've personally been working on this for five years, so I know myself, so the team, what is the science team. My name's you know, Scott. Obviously, like a day like today when there is a rocket launching is probably a bit different than a normal day, but what is it actually like to have to get the operational side to the moment that we'll see a little bit later tonight of a rocket taking off? Yeah, good question. Um, today's actually probably one of the most uh, relaxed days I've <laughs> had in the last little while, um, but it's been a big process, you know. Um, I came on in September last year yep. and uh, kind of <laughs> hit the ground running and haven't looked back really. Um, and we've gone through all sorts of different things that we have to get through. And the biggest challenge has been uh, building the team on the fly while, while working to get all of our documentation approved yep. and make sure that everything is safe as possible. Um, and so we've spent many months kind of working around that and, and finally getting those approvals in place so that um, when we get here and, and are ready to launch a rocket, everything's safe and, and ready to go. I mean, because I think that's one of the critical things that we sometimes, especially when you see rockets taking off, are complacent of. It is a rocket yeah. being launched with fuel and triggering mechanisms and all sorts of things and ordinances. Like, there's an ordinance person Correct. right here, yeah, right? I right, mean, yeah. So there's a list of these jobs that 
probably aren't your normal work site, yeah? No, that's correct, yeah. So explosive ordinance approvals in the local, <laughs> state, and territory, import, export approvals, um, a shot fires license for the guy who presses the button at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, you name it, all of our environmental approvals. Uh, you know, it's been, been a massive journey, um, but we've gotten through everything, uh, and, so it's really good. And then organizing a helicopter to go fly out and yep. pick it up. And, 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 you know, we're in, as we've seen, a remote location, so it's not like you can just go down the road to do this stuff. So, I mean, how do you build a team? How do you build an equipment in a remote location? Which, you know, it's obviously important that it has to be here. Yep. But it also means those infrastructure challenges are actually real challenges. You don't just get electricity. You don't just get That's right. internet. That's right. So we worked NASA, with NASA a little bit on the beginning of the design for uh, the site and the layout yep. that would support their campaign, but also allow us to grow into future campaigns. Um, and that gave us a kind of a, a good head start on it. And then it was a bit, bit of working with a lot of the locals here who do know how to get things done. Yep. Um, it's, you still face some logistical challenges with, with the location we're but we have great facilities at the deep sea port here in town. Yep. Um, we had to you know, jump on building a team quickly from around Australia, using both locals here as well as um, bringing in from different cities. So we're a bit of a fly in, fly out team right now. Uh, and that's been really, really enjoyable. Um, but it also brings its quirkiness of you know <laughs> bringing to get together a team that is used to corporate kind of working styles, and, and we're now on on site in, in a kind of remote fly and fly out situation. I wouldn't say this is a very corporate situation at no, all, to be right. honest. No, it's, it's a bit different, and, and that just creates you know great diversity in the team uh, under pressure. Um, we just really you know have bonded quite well as a team, yeah. and it's come come together at the very end. And so on a day like today, when we are getting ready for this launch. What is actually your responsibility? Are you kind of overseeing then all of that in kind of real time? Yeah, so as kind of a manager of the facility, we, we have to ensure that the facility is ready to support yep. our client, NASA. Um, that includes, you know, keeping some compliance and uh, an awareness of how NASA is prepared. Yep. Um, so that what they've done is if further procedures and is safe. Um, we then cross check against ours on those as well. We go through our own launch readiness review, which we went through yesterday and everything's ready to go. Um, and then we basically just c c let the team have a little bit of a break today. Yeah. Um, we do our safety procedures on range clearance, make sure everything's out of the up-range area, um, and then we kind of relax a little bit and go into the countdown uh, from about four or five tonight. Yeah, and you know, it, and I think this is kind of the critical point here. It's you know, NASA is the customer. At the end of the day, it's Equatorial Launch Australia mm -hmm. right. that's actually responsible for that rocket, both pre and, and also what happens after. Correct. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, that's the nuance of you know the commercial angle to this to our company and to the to this venture that NASA is doing with us is um, it's the first time for them to go at a commercial port where we have extra um, liability that we take on as as the company, and so we have to be very careful on that and, and to make sure everything's in place safely, which it is. I mean. It, now, I also have to say, I mean, you, you are managing quite literally a rocket facility. Did you ever imagine that? Uh, not really. I mean, when I first finished my degree in uh, 2004 um, in Brisbane at UQ, like, we wanted to get into rockets. Yeah. And we did a project on rockets, but wasn't much happening in, in no. Australia at that point. And then the last few years, it's just kind of come out of nowhere. And, I, you know, through the through, you know, personal contact, I was able to find this opportunity. and kind of like, well, this will be a bit different, and it's been a bit different, and it's been pretty amazing. But I, and I think that's the amazing thing, as you said, you know, I mean, even five years ago, you know, I know ELA was starting to do all the groundwork, but really to even think about five years ago that, you know, we'd have a rocket launch yeah, today, know. you know, I know myself and a lot of the community, it's not that you're doubting, it was just like, <laughs> it just wasn't really a thing, right? And it's been kind of, a, you know, almost until yesterday where we had a big group photo with the whole team and NASA with the, in the rocket in its kind of vertical position. Um, you, you didn't quite know you were there. I mean, you've been yeah. head down trying to get it all done, and then now it's, okay, wow, it was a bit of a surreal moment. You're standing it's in there. front of a rocket we're, we're in Australia. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, what do you think next? Obviously, there's three launches happening as part of this campaign tonight, the 4th and the 12th of July. What's after that? Well, you know, what's the future yep. for you? I mean, obviously, there's no rocket scheduled yet, but that will change, hopefully, right? Correct, yeah. No, we, we need to continue to build out our team and the capability we have that we can uh, lean into some of the services that NASA has done this time around. Yep. And that, you know, is good for us as an extra service to provide to other clients. Um, and, and, you know, so we'll continue to build out our team in, um, over the next few months, getting ready for that next one. And I would, I would assume you would have a few long working days. Yeah, you get a little bit of holiday time off after uh, these yeah. three launches. I'm looking forward to it, yeah, probably a few weeks off. Uh, <laughs> I've got three young kids, um, so thankfully my wife has been looking after them while I've been away. Uh, and so I look forward to getting back to them. But I guess, uh, will they be here for the launch? Uh, not this one, no. Oh, okay. No. But, you know, you know, they will be able to see Dad's successful work launching into space. I mean, I think that's just an amazing achievement. And it's not an amazing achievement, I think, for your children, but a lot of the kids 
who are thinking about going to high school, college, I would like to work in the space industry, build a rocket, build a satellite. You're kind of showing tonight, yeah, yeah it's do it. Yeah. You can do it. It's possible, yeah. And I think um, my wife said the other day, Ruben, my uh, oldest boy, said, I want to I want to shoot rockets, you know, up into the sky when I grow up, so. It's great to think that you're going to make cool. that a family business. <laughs> I'll see how we get into work, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, and yeah, uh, you got a busy night tonight, yeah. and good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. So, so, so during this program, as we're live now, you'll see a bunch of these pre-recorded content that we have before. Uh, obviously, people like Ben right now are busy on site uh, making sure this rocket is going. Uh, this is a really important thing to see. We're now just around less than 70 minutes to launch, so we're still scheduled for... Um, we're still scheduled for launch at about, um, uh, sorry, 11.14 Australian Central Standard Time. The person on the site right next to me, Daryl, he is the man making sure all the checks are happening, all the timing is in sequence, and everyone's doing their job, including me. Um, and for those of you who had some audio issues as we were swapping to it, uh, sometimes if you hit refresh on the stream, hopefully that should be fixed. Now, um, this rocket is a 22-meter uh, rocket that's carrying about a two-ton total carry payload. And this includes the primary mission, which is a X-ray quantum calimeter. So this is measuring X-ray light from the Milky Way galaxy, led by Dan McCannon out of the University of Wisconsin. Now, we also heard from a number of people, and we're or going to throughout this broadcast, um, this facility is the combination of a lot of people who have been built, not just for today, but including a lot of people who have worked to the leading up of this building. And so we're about to hear from one of those people who's been here from a long time to get this facility up. And a facility like a rocket port or a spaceport doesn't happen overnight. And we're going to hear a little bit about Equatorial Launch Australia, who's hosting NASA's launch right now. And tonight, we're doing Australia's first space launch from here in Arnhem Land. So watch this coverage and you will see the first commercial rocket launched into space from Australia and the first time that NASA has ever launched from a commercial spaceport um, ever. So here with Michael on what is, I'd say a momentous occasion today is a, a small way of describing it. Yep, every <laughs> interview so far has asked me how's the excitement level. <laughs> have had no excitement, just been too busy. <laughs> but today, starting to get a little bit of a vibe at, oh, today's the day. So the excitement level is, is increasing a bit. So that's good, because I want to enjoy it. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, because yeah. this process has been not just the past few weeks or past few months, this process has been quite literally years in the making. Uh, this has been an exercise of 7,000 cuts. Yeah. Um, we submitted the start of our uh, launch license about almost two years ago to the day. Yep. Um, that's been a, a long, arduous process. Um, the building of the site here and doing anything in a remote location yeah. is challenging. Um, and of course, if you're going to be in an industry, in an industry sector, let's pick one that's really sort of nice and simple <laughs> like space. Okay? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't need any sort of technology involved no, at no, all. No, no, no. That's right. <laughs> and you don't need to find people who know anything. Right? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, so we've had some challenges and it's been a long road. But, um, you know, despite like feeling on yeah. occasions that every roadblock in the world's been put in front of us. You know, we've got here, it's a great day, and, and you know, we are starting to get excited about it. And, and I think there, there's just a buzz that you're starting to see amongst, as I said, not just you, but everyone who seems to be working here. You know, there are people who have been, you know, we were talking to someone, he's been working here on site for the past, you know, 12 weeks, he's like, I just want to see the launch tonight, right? You know, I just want to get to that moment. Yeah, I don't think we did it on purpose, yeah. but I think what you do is you leverage what the end game is all the way through these things. So everybody starts to get a feel for, yeah, I want to get to the end and I want to see, you know, what this is all about. And what's a really interesting dynamic is the mix of, you know, the 75 years of experience of NASA yeah. and all the people who are just insanely professional. Mm. They're so good at what they do. I mean, and, and, and they're so regimented and, I mean, rehearsed. Some and... could say inflexible, but uh, <laughs> let's just say they're very structured in what they do. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of it, it's us. You know, we're, we're here, we're sponges. We're trying to soak up 
every bit yeah. that we can from them. And you could not want, as a startup company, to have a better launch customer, pardon the pun. You know, it's pretty hard to do these conversations without you know working in this <laughs> space and <laughs> having the launch customer. But, but anyway, the job. that's the beauty of the job, yeah, right? Is the yeah, pun. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we couldn't have yeah. a better customer to start off with because of both reputation, skill, and just their generosity of passing on information mm. and working with us. And at the end of the day, you know. Um, there's this one guy who has to finally decide, are we going to launch it? Yeah. That guy looks like me. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I have to remind them of that occasionally. <laughs> and, it, and it's also the, not the responsibility just to the people on the site uh, or NASA or the science payloads. It's, you know, in some degree, the entire community, as you know, we've talked about, uh, who's been invested in this. Huge span of stakeholders from... You know, the Northern Territory government yeah. have been really instrumental in getting us off the ground, um, all the way through to all the different um, traditional owner yes. um, and indigenous groups who we want to engage with, but we have to engage with because we're on their land. Yeah. And in, specifically for these three missions, the payloads are landing back on their yeah. land, so yeah. we have to coordinate with them. And there's then the absolute myriad of interagency things that yeah. you need to do from explosive ordnance, environment, um, transport, aviation, uh, maritime. Yeah, could, could you have people around CASA, the space agency, safety, sight rangers? You know, it's not just rockets. You know, this is going to be the first commercial launch in Australia. Uh, and, and that means a lot for the Australian space industry, not just ELA. Yeah, um, as I've traveled around the globe in the last sort of 12 months, talking to all the major players in the space world, one of the things that has really struck me is there are Australians everywhere. Yep. And so, to some degree, bringing that home and showing that we have a capability yeah, yeah, here, right. and this is our coming out party in a big way, um, and to show that Australian technology and innovation and entrepreneurship yep can you know be at the forefront of the world stage in space yeah. is a big state um, and I think that there are a lot of other great Australian companies yeah, in space there is. but you know the fleet technologies yep. who are doing uh, satellites the skycraft in Canberra yep. doing satellites who will hopefully have another launch this year yeah, that's right and Myota um, yep. You know, Southern Launch, our launch partners, yep. who are coming up tonight, which is really nice. That's right, and hoping to have that, you know, this kind of same facility, but in the south. And that's the beauty of it is this isn't just representing this site. It is what Australia is going to become. Um, but certainly with Southern Space, we talk to it, Southern Launch, sorry, we uh, yeah. talk to them all the time. We get on really well with them um, because we have common problems, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and common challenges. So we try to help each other out where we can. And I'm a big believer in, you know, the sum of the parts is always going to be, yeah. you know, the best part of it and so you know let, let's 10 years we have a first launch tonight yeah what do you think arnhem space center looks like in 10 years well where we're standing at the moment is on what i would call you know site one yep yeah you know, the end of the first phase which gives us the ability to do medium-sized rockets yep. so up to about 450 to 500 kilos in payload yep the rocket itself sitting on the pad can be up to you know, 200,000 kilos yep. sitting on the so so reasonably large. This is site one. Yeah. Um, immediately, to, you know, a kilometre, you know, to our east here yeah. is site two, and we will eventually have, you know, the drawing at the moment has 24 pads on it. Yep. Um, it has to be very carefully planned yeah. so that we can do a launch effectively every six to nine days. Yep. And so tonight, it's all happening tonight, right? Yep. We're now inside the countdown. Um, we started the countdown at eight hours before launch. Yep. Um, there's a whole bunch of activities. It's incredibly detailed and scripted what happens, the number of checks, the number of players. There's over 100 people on site. Um, all extraneous, non-required people are off site for safety. Um, but they're working through the checks. They're rehearsing you know, as they go and then executing. We have to have a huge amount of external communications mm. as well. So airspace, maritime, um, local emergency services, coordinating with security, um, just talking to everybody else on site. Because it's still that. a rocket that is being launched tonight, right? That's Absolutely. the thing. Absolutely. You know, we're about to fire a projectile um, <laughs> that's going 300 kilometres into space. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's coming back to exactly where we want it. <laughs> Now, so... Attention all stations, attention all stations, attention all stations. Launch 
lunch countdown is now at T minus 60 minutes. Facility managers out. And so we've just gotten the official call. We're now at T minus 60 minutes to the first launch. So now we will resume our countdown for an hour till then. So that puts still the launch right now on our new target of 1114 Australian Central Standard Time, 1144 Australian Eastern Standard Time for this rocket, 144 UTC. Now, we will be here until this thing takes off because that's what we're all here for. We have people gathered from a number of agencies to make this happen. And again, we will keep cutting to live vision of it. When the rocket takes off, again, as a scheduled time now and just under an hour from now, we will be showing you shots from the launch pad as it's ready to take off. And we're gonna follow it for as long as it goes. Now, this is a sounding rocket. So the sounding rocket is what we call a suborbital rocket. So it doesn't quite reach orbit. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't go that high. Um, we determine space starts around 100 kilometers. This is what we call the Kármán line. Now, this line actually varies. This is the line that you could, in theory, maintain in orbit, but it varies between about 85 and 120 or so kilometers. 100 is a nice hey, round number My that we can all remember. Uh, the U.S. likes to use 50 miles. But that's just an archaic unit, so we'll stick to 100 kilometers. Now, the thing about that is that's just the minimum height, really, you say, to reach space. This rocket tonight is going to reach a, a height, what we call apogee, of 350 kilometers. Now, this is necessary for the science payload. Again, this is a X-ray quantum kilometer, so this is measuring... Uh, the Milky Way emission. So uh, if you go to a dark sky place like we are here in Arnhem Space Center, you can see the beautiful Milky Way going across the sky. Now, the Milky Way can be seen in the southern and the northern hemisphere, but you actually get to see different parts of the Milky Way. One of the fact of the unique things about the southern skies is you actually get to see the galactic center. This is the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. This can be only viewed from the southern skies. You cannot view from the northern skies. So this is kind of one of the amazing things that we get to see. Now, as I said before, we did have a slight launch delay. Uh, I am oh. just hearing the rain yet again. Uh, so much for the Darwin Northern Territory dry season as the storm is pouring above us. Now, the great thing about live TV is we're going to keep going and you're going to keep watching until we see this rocket take off. Now, the weather doesn't necessarily impact it as much as you may think. Uh, one of the big things the rocket does need to have is the wind coming down. Uh, you do need the wind to have a fairly stable, and it's not just the, the breeze, it's really the gust. They cannot have a lot of gust with it. So the rain isn't as big of a deal as actually one may think. Things like the science instruments are all contained inside the rocket, obviously, so they're protected from those environmental variables. So what you're really worried about is any so uh, extra wind, any extra so storms that may happen to the gantry. That's that metal so thing that we are just looking at that hopefully we'll cut to in a second to see what the rocket is up close. That is the support structure uh, for the rocket before it takes off. Now, again, the wind is the key here. So far, the winds seem to be actually cooperating. So even though we're getting these refreshing Northern Territory dry season showers, um, which is fairly uncommon from up here, uh, it is the sort of thing that well, you just deal with when you're launching it. You know, we often hear of launches from Florida. You know, Florida is Cape Canaveral's kind of in a swamp. Uh, you know, they have gators, we have crocodiles. Uh, so it's kind of a similar idea, but we are not going to be as impacted as much maybe as what you would get in Florida because, again, the rain's already stopped. We're actually already still in countdown of the rocket. So not really that necessarily big of an impact as one may think. Just create some uh, fun experiments for all the people working on site. And, you know, speaking of on site, this this launch is the first commercial mission for NASA. Yes, NASA works with lots of private companies. They work with SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, Boeing, Airbus. But one of the things that is quite different is when NASA is usually launching a rocket, they are operating the spaceport, or at least have a fairly big setup in it. This mission is done completely with a private company, Equatorial Launch Australia. And so this is the very first commercial launch that NASA is doing, where essentially NASA is controlling the rocket about 150 meters behind me. 
But here it is the Australian staff of Equatorial Launch Australia that is managing that process. They are the ones responsible before launch, during launch, and what happens after launch. And what happens after launch is the critical recovery of the rocket components and the science components. And so we're actually going to go start hearing from NASA pre-recorded, obviously, they're a bit busy uh, getting this rocket ready. Uh, and from the operations manager, Scott, who he's in kind of charge of the three missions that are happening in Australia right now. And we're going to hear about his experience, what it's been like to work on this very historic mission. Again, not just for Australia, but NASA as well. Scott Bissett, I'm the deputy chief for the NASA Sounding Rockets Program Office, as well as the Australia 2022 campaign manager. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, it's been you know, over 10 years in the making to get out here. Uh, it's been over 20 years since we've actually launched from Australia. I've personally been working on this for five years. So I know myself, the team, the science community back home are, are really excited to be back here and, and be doing some really great and critical science for NASA. So it's the first uh, launch for NASA from a foreign commercial launch site. Um, so we've probably been working at this for over 10 years. I've personally been working at it for five years. Um, you know, <laughs> Two to three years, that was actually just the legal, getting yeah. you know, NASA legal to buy in on, on doing this commercial. Um, and then the rest just planning. You know, when we started, when I came out here in 2019, this was all trees. <laughs> uh, the first time we did the site survey, so a lot of work and just getting everything set up. And so, so how did you guys decide for these three launches launching from here? Sure. So, um, you know, we had in the past, back in 1995, we were able to launch from Woomera. Yep. Um, and we intended to go back there, but because of some legislation, it made it very hard for, for NASA to get back there. It was more geared towards commercial and, yeah. and DOD. Um, and so after several years of trying to work that angle, um, you know, commercial launch, you know, started to become big here. And we heard about uh, Equatorial Launch yep. Australia. And for these three missions, um, we're looking at Southern Hemisphere targets. And you know they're very expensive telescopes that we'd like to get back. <laughs> yes. So having a land-based range with a lot of wide open area where we can uh, you know bring these payloads back down on a parachute was critical. Yeah, so landing in the ocean is not conducive to recovery of these not. things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Electronic. It can be done, but it's it's a lot more risky. And it's like it's a lot easier when you have a lot of more land that you can recover and safely navigate, right? Because that's one of the critical aspects here is when it takes off. There's yep. not a lot downrange, so to speak. That's correct. Yep, a large, wide open swath of land where we can actually land these things and go pick them up. And so, when you're actually deciding and doing this launch, what does it look like? Because I think everyone thinks T minus nine, eight, seven, six, but the day starts long before then, right? That's correct. So for the first launch, we actually start at eight, eight hours and fifteen minutes before uh, the T zero time, um, with a lot of. Um, actually work on the experiment itself. So this one is super cooled, so yep. we have to do some liquid helium transfers. Um, so there's about three hours of experiment prep okay. uh, before we actually get into the countdown itself. Um, and then the way we, we do the countdown, we do what we call a horizontal check, where the payload's still sitting in a horizontal position, um, and we run through our 10-minute terminal count in that horizontal position to make sure all of our systems are working as expected all the way through T0. Um, if that looks good, then we actually go out to the pad um, and we'll do our arming. Uh, so we actually arm the payload, you know, connect up our firing lines, pull the shelter back, um, and then we will elevate to a vertical position. We then again run through that 10 minute count um, and make sure everything's working. You know, no cables have come loose yep. during the elevation. Um, once that's all good to go, then we're ready for our terminal count. Uh, so our terminal count's only about 10 minutes long. Okay. Uh, so, these. so it's still but a, it's, I it's still, a long period of time. I, I imagine <laughs> it's also a long period. It's also, I also imagine it's a long 10 minutes, right? It's not just sitting there twiddling your thumb. It There's is. There's a bit to do. There is. So in that 10 minutes, um, we start by powering on the payload itself. Um, and then there's a lot of checks, you know, we bring systems on one at a time, make sure we're getting good data. Um, and then at about T minus three minutes, we actually switch everything to internal power. Um, so we're getting yep. housekeeping data back, say, okay, our battery levels are good, everything's on internal power. And then, yeah, at about 90 seconds out, we get the final go call from the, the, the team and we're uh, hopefully green when we hit that point. Now, how long does it actually take from that go point launching to actually reaching um, not its orbit, but its peak height? Um, so it's less than 10 minutes. I can't recall exactly what yeah. it is for the first one, but um, the entire flight from launch until uh, the payload comes back down on shoot is only about 15 minutes. Yep. Um, and of those 15 minutes, we're only taking science data for about five minutes. 
but, um, but that's a critical five minutes for a lot oh, of these experiments, right? Extremely critical. Uh, so everything has to go as planned. We do a lot of rehearsing for those five minutes. Um, for the second two missions, they actually have what we call an uplink. Yep. So they'll be getting video feeds back on the ground real time to make sure they're pointing on target. Yes. And if we see we're offset by some amount, you know, they actually have you know a joystick more <laughs> or less, and they can control to point us back on target. So we rehearse that a lot leading up to because the last thing you want to do is get up there. You have five minutes to get on target and. Yeah, swing left and push it on right. Or, <laughs> and then you yeah. missed your target and then you completely. Missed your target and, yep, that, Th that's, that's a it, yeah. uh, technical failure, unfortunately. Yes. But, uh, and so, how often do you actually are launching sounding rockets? Obviously, right. first time for a long time in Australia, that's but for right. the U.S. Um, so, in the U.S., so our program travels around the world. So, we do launch from Wallops, which is NASA's only owned and operated launch range. But we also launch out of Norway, yep. out of Svalbard, uh, Poker Flats, Alaska. Uh, White Sands, New Mexico, the Marshall Islands, and, yep. and now Australia. But uh, our program sort of built around 18 to 22 missions a year. Okay. Uh, in fact, we, we actually launched a mission from Wallops this morning at 5.30 in the morning uh, for a student mission back home. Okay, uh, and, now, so and then you're getting ready for... Less than 48 hours later, hopefully we'll have one launch from Australia. And so do you, is, that, is there a view that by having multiple these sites that potentially there is that growth of having more of this program available to these experiments? Absolutely. I mean, so the the 18 to 22 are sort of you know spread out, and we just go to where the scientists want to yeah. go. So um, you know, wherever the grants come in, we're we're happy to go. Um, but there is a lot of interest. You know, it's been like I said over two decades since we've launched in the southern hemisphere. Um, so there's quite a backlog of uh, <laughs> science to be done down here. And that's the critical thing, right? All of these experiments require targets in the southern skies that you just can't do from a northern That's launch site. There's just no way to do it. So uh, yeah, you physically have to be down here. And, and like I said, Australia is one of the only places you can get that big land mass where we need to go out and recover. And so what after this? We get three successful launches. That's what we're going to have. We're going to think positive three successful launches. You know, is there a, you know, our hope that you're going to come back again and do more of these? There is. Um, you know, so I know there's there's several scientists that would have loved to come with, come with us on this mission, but we sort of limited it to, uh, to three. Um, but, you know, assuming this one's successful, our our goal is to come back at least every three to five years and then you know one, once you prove it can be done and it gets easier to come back you know then it's it's easier to do it you know more frequently than every three to five years or 20 years yeah. in I days. guess the, the first time driving a car is hard the 30th time you've done it it's just kind of that's commonplace right. that's, that's right, right. Um, and that's how we started at some of our other remote cam uh, remote ranges you know where it was every three to five years such as Norway and now we launch there nearly every year well, look, thanks for joining us, and uh, we will look forward to catching you in action later. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, we are approaching that kind of critical time of having the rocket take off. So we're just under almost 47 minutes to launch. Now, there hasn't been any changes to the schedule aside from that initial 30-minute launch. So we're still just 47 minutes now, just ticking over that mark to launch. Now, one of the things that I said that we have happened up here at Darnham Space Center is we've had a bit of rain during the dry season. So now when we go to this live shot of the rocket, you may see a few raindrops on the uh, camera itself. So uh, fortunately, that distortion is from the rain. Now, one of the good things about a rocket is it'll kind of dry the rain later, so we're not that worried about it. Um, but it has been drying throughout the day, so it shouldn't be as big of a deal. Now, what we are looking at here is, if you could just see just on the right is the rocket itself. On the left is the gantry. This is the support structure for the rocket to take off. Um, later in the program, we have gone up close to the rocket during the daytime, obviously, so we can see it. Now, again, this is a night launch in Australia. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, why is it a night launch? Now, there's a few good logistical reasons why. Um, there are operational considerations happening for both the launch and the coming down of the launch. It also is an astronomy mission. You kind of want it to be dark at some point when you're doing some astronomy and calibrations. Uh, this also is being coordinated with NASA Wallops facility. Now, NASA Wallops is in the east coast of the U.S., and with the time difference, this is actually kind of convenient, believe it or not. Um, it's better than being completely in the middle of the night. And we also have a three-hour launch window. So... If there is further delays, we still can go up to three hours post our initial scheduled launch. Again, that is not that case as of now, but that builds us time to make sure this rocket does take off today. Now, it is an amazing opportunity to be here. I am originally based in, in Canberra. It is a, a fair assessment to say I'm a fan of rockets taking off.
And I think you are too if you're joining in to see this. And so when we see this rocket taking off later, we will see the shot from the ground as it takes off and we will panning again as far and high as you can see. Now, as we mentioned in the beginning of the show, uh, only if you're in the vast regular region, so to speak, of East Arnhem and Arnhem Land will you actually maybe be able to see anything. You're not encouraged to come here. Now, this is not because we like people. This is purely for safety and operational reasons. Um, you're more than welcome to look at home if you're in the region. Now, if you're in Darwin, you are going to be too far west. Queensland is too far east to see this. So unfortunately, you will not see it. But if you're in a southwest trajectory from Nolamboy, uh, up here in Yolan country, you may be able to see it as it takes off. Um, but then again, uh, you can also watch it here on our stream. Now, one of the exciting things about this is why NASA is here. And this is, I think, a critical part of this story. Why did NASA choose the Arnhem Space Center? Why did NASA say, now's the time to come and launch a rocket from Australia? Well, there, there's some really good reasons. As we're about to hear from Kevin, one of the science investigators, one of the people who's been pushing NASA for over a decade to come and do this, is to actually be able to do the science that is only visible in the southern skies. Now, our Earth is a globe. There are some things you can see from the northern hemisphere, some things you can see from the south. And yes, the southern hemisphere does have better skies than the northern hemisphere. We also have less light pollution. We are in a beautiful dark spot where the stars just pop out in the night sky. And some of these targets that we'll be looking at, like this first instrument looking at the southern part of our Milky Way galaxy, like the second and third flights that will happen on 4 July and 12 July, they need to specifically look at objects that are only visible in the southern hemisphere. You cannot see it from the north. And at the beauty of being at the Artem Space Center is with the remote location, with the ability to control it, and being so close to the, the equator, this is a great combination for launching a rocket. And that is, again, why we are here today. This is why NASA is here to have this. And so we're going to hear from Kevin France. He has been one of these people pushing NASA to come here to have this launch. And he has as much invested, if not more than it. He has two experiments involved, the 4th of July, which is the second launch, and the 12th of July, which will be the third launch. He wants to see this happen because he wants his precious data and he wants his science as something I can appreciate. So let's go hear from Kevin, who we caught up with earlier today. Hi, I'm Kevin France from the University of Colorado. I'm NASA's campaign scientist for the ELA launches. I'm also the principal investigator of the Sistine mission, which is going to launch on July 4th. I've been working on this project for about 10 years, uh, trying to find a way to bring our telescopes to the southern hemisphere to observe Alpha Centauri. I'm just extremely excited to be here at this beautiful new launch site, uh, be able to launch on the 4th and uh, see this exciting ultraviolet data of Alpha Centauri A and B. Kevin is the campaign scientist, right? That's right. So, and the second mission, though, is a tad closer to your heart? That's right, yeah. I'm also the principal investigator for the second mission, the Sistine flight that's going to go on July 4th. Now, what is Sistine going to do? So Sistine is an ultraviolet spectrograph that's going to study Alpha Centauri, a uh, very beautiful southern hemisphere sky, a uh, yep. bright star. Uh, and we're going to study the ultraviolet radiation from that star to understand uh, how habitable planets may exist around that star. So, yeah, so, cause, so Alpha Centauri is that star near the Southern Cross that That's right. we love to look at. And so do we... How many planets do we know of around Alpha Centauri? So there's a debatable planet around <laughs> Alpha Centauri today, but um, it's a huge target for finding and searching for Earth-like planets yeah. around solar-like stars. So with the, Alpha Centauri is actually a, a spectacular twin of the yes. sun. And so being the nearest sun-like star, it's the focus of a lot of our efforts to find Earth-like planets. Yeah, because it is that, and, you know, that rough idea that maybe one day missions could be sent even to Alpha Centauri in a very distant future at least right. um, but it's the closest we get really that's right besides our sun that's right it's our best our best shot to find another you know earth 2.0 so when you say ultraviolet so what do people mean so in Australia we're very used to uh, being sunburnt during the summer um, so is this the sort of same ultraviolet light that you're looking at it's actually even more ultraviolet you know it's all part of the larger electromagnetic spectrum but uh, the, the the rays that we're worried about at the beach are th we call them in wavelengths 300 nanometers yep. we're about three times shorter wavelengths than that down to about 100 nanometers and so that means you're also probing hotter 
That's bits right. of the, the star in the system. That's right. It's also why we have to put it on a rocket because we have to get above Earth's atmosphere, which is the protective layer is great for us when we're at the beach, but rough if you're trying to study the light. So that's the, so that's the only way, right? So you have to put this on a rocket up there to see it. And because the target is in the southern hemisphere, you need to launch from the south. From the south. That's yeah. right. That's why we, uh, <laughs> we've been asking NASA to do this for 10 years, because there are these beautiful targets in the southern hemisphere we just can't observe from our normal launch sites. Now, you have a little bit to do also with the third mission, part of your broader team? That's right. Uh, so the third mission is also coming from the University of Colorado, and I developed the science case for that uh, mission as well. Uh, it's all part of our larger team uh, that works together, and it's, it's observing even farther ultraviolet light, what we call extreme ultraviolet light, which goes down to about 55 nanometers nanometers, yep. which is really, yeah. really short wavelengths, yeah. And is it also going to be looking at Alpha Centauri as well? That's right. It's studying Alpha Centauri. The idea was that the Sistine and the DEUCE missions, Launch 2 and Launch 3, would be like a joint science project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they would just cover different parts of the spectrum because we don't have one instrument that can do everything. That's right, because the technologies actually have to be very different it's from very looking specific. in those. That's right. So are, are, are these missions or telescopes built specifically for for this, or have you have been flown previously? So, Sistine was developed, uh, Launch 2 was developed for this exact science case. In okay. fact, it was designed for this star um, okay. uh, right. about, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, the other mission, Launch 3 Deuce, uh, it was also designed to study very massive stars. Okay. So, yep. um, uh, very bright blue stars. And it's launched uh, three times already to study blue stars, but we kind of, you know, tweaked it a little bit and repurposed it for uh, for this science case. Now, what are you hoping the, the data will show? Because I think this is one of the exciting things is I think people think, hey, telescope goes up and you have pretty pictures on your computer screen. Not exactly yeah. what happens. This is the less beautiful side of astronomy. <laughs> this is spectroscopy. And so, you know, this is basically we take a spectrum of the star's light and we analyze where are the bumps and wiggles in this wiggly line. Um, but there's so much information there because yep. from a spectrum we can understand how hot something right. is, what it's made of, you know, what its mo the motions of the gas are. Yeah, some of its age. Its and, age, yeah, yeah. exactly. All these things we can't get from a picture alone. So, uh, so we're building these into kind of a, a catalog of these ultraviolet spectra that we're going to use to understand which are the best star planet systems to search for life. And so how long does it actually take to get that data back? It happens in real time. It comes down on the telemetry link yep. that's on board the rocket. So okay. we see it. Uh, we see it in real time. In fact, we use the real time to, uh, video to decide how to point the rocket during oh. the flight. Yeah, so Scott was talking about this, that you slightly have to adjust the rocket to align on the target, and so that's how you kind of that's know right. where to align. It's like the world's most expensive video game. <laughs> yeah, it's, and we have our, our students. This is always a historical way that we do things in the, in the project, is that we put the student right in the deep end, and they're the ones that are actually seeing the real-time display and are driving the rocket in real time to make the observation. So they either get their PhD or they don't. <laughs> is that course, the, that's yeah. right. Or there's a tremendous amount of international resources wasted. <laughs> so so when, you're, when you're doing this adjustment, once the rocket rocket is launched and you're essentially starting to get into suborbital space, you guys then take over all of that pointing and stuff like that, That's right? right. It happens at about 100 seconds after launch. Okay. The attitude control system, uh, so we go up with the, the pointy end up, yep. <laughs> and then uh, our telescope looks out the back. So it flips over during the flight. Okay. Yep. There's a door that opens, and our telescope points towards the target, and then we can start steering in to, to bring the target into the aperture. And then do you have any control of it coming back down, or essentially it gets there, you're done, and... So yeah, we all we can do is control uh, the pointing during the flight. We yeah, can also okay. uh, turn on and off the instrument if yeah. something were wrong. But yeah. uh, we we've his, knock on wood, we've never had to do that. It'll be fine this time. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, and then, but the rest of it all happens on timers. So at about 450 seconds after the observations start, uh, the power will turn off, the door will close, and it the whole payload starts to spin as it re-enters the atmosphere, yep. and it spins to distribute the heat so it doesn't melt part of the rocket as so, it comes so, in. So on the the long side of the rocket essentially right that's right yeah. yeah and so then you go out then the day after and recover your instrument that's right so there's a helicopter that's on site and uh we pick up everything for this launch we pick up there's there's a it's a two-stage motor so we pick up the booster motor and yep. the sustainer motor and we also go but we go first to go get the science payload because yeah. it has the most sort of it doesn't like to be sitting outside for a while. yeah because it has to be very cooled and 
It is a telescope, and a telescope yeah. that just got dropped back to Earth. <laughs> exactly. So we, we go out the next morning, and uh, we'll probably do a couple of flyovers to go find it, yep. and then we'll land. I believe we're going to sling it up underneath the helicopter and ferry it back here, and then we'll test it again to see if it survived. And yeah, so say, sister, do you test it? You, you do have we to will. test it when you come back? We'll test it when we come back before we box it up. Yeah. And then do you do, you know, depending on that status, do you do any slight adjustments or fixing or kind of depends not at this point this yeah. is really just an aliveness test for when it comes yeah. back okay. because okay. nasa wants to know if uh if things survived okay. and, and okay. the status of the instrument when we bring it back okay and yeah. then any other work that may be needed would happen back it, in the lab it in the happens US. back in the lab that's right great yeah. well look uh so you're the second launch is scheduled for the fourth of july fourth of july and then the third launch is the 12th of july that's correct? right yep uh and, and those windows are there's still a few launch windows for each of those that's right i think each has three days okay. uh, that we can do i i think the conditions here have been really very nice i yeah. say now um, <laughs> so uh i'm pretty optimistic that we'll be able to launch on the original dates planned but uh but yeah we've got a three-day backup in case well that look it's great to have and we look forward to seeing uh cysteine induce induce uh in orbit looking at alpha centauri absolutely So we're outside Mish Control. This is the just the rocket firing but the rocket taking off and seeing the gloriousness of a rocket going into space so we will have multiple cameras we will have multiple action shots as we get closer to that time so for those who missed the beginning now you're probably waiting for a rocket to take off in about two minutes we had an initial 30 minute delay added at the beginning, right at the beginning as we went live. Now, these delays are normal. I mean, delays happen all the time. Um, the Space Launch System, for instance, this is NASA's new moon rocket. Uh, they were trying to test just the filling up part. This wasn't actually the launch part. This was what they called the wet rehearsal. Uh, now, that was delayed multiple times, actually delayed three times, fully plus time during the day. So, you know, these delays are normal, and again, Part of the reason why is to make sure all the checks, everything is working. You know, when you hop on an airplane, if you've ever seen, there's a lot of checks the pilots do to make sure everything's working. This is just like this, just a tad more. There's a few more things to check. It's not just the science. It's making sure the airspace is clear. It's making sure the surrounding land is clear. Now, it's making sure the flight trajectory is understood. It's making sure the winds the weather, the science instrument, because if the science instrument for some reason isn't ready, the rocket's not gonna launch, because the whole point here for this very first launch is launching what's called an X-ray uh, quantum calinometer. Now this is measuring X-ray light uh, from our Milky Way galaxy. Now, when you think of X-ray light, you think of broken bones going to the hospital. 
it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's still the same type of light. And in fact, lots of things in our universe emit X-ray light. Uh, black holes are popular emitting a little bit of X-ray. There's a lot of X-ray emission or X-ray light that emits from the center of our galaxy. And that's one of the critical reasons why this mission is happening. So in particular, if you're looking at the southern parts of the Milky Way, where the center of our galaxy is located, and you want to understand what is this very energetic stuff emitting from our galaxy, you can only see that from space because luckily our Earth's atmosphere blocks most of the X-ray emission. Otherwise, we'd be bombarded with X-ray radiation every day and we probably wouldn't have humans here to talk about this launch. Now, what we will be seeing later is that preparation for that launch about to take place. And as we were just hearing from Kevin, uh, so Kevin is one of the mission scientists. He's the whole program scientist for all three missions, but he in particular is focused on mission two called Cysteine and mission three called Deuce. Now, both of these will be looking at ultraviolet light. Uh, so this is one of my favorite things. Uh, I like to use ultraviolet light to study stars that explode. What Kevin's team is doing is looking at ultraviolet light from something called Alpha Centauri. So if you go on a dark night in the southern skies and you look towards the Southern Cross, now, there's two bright stars near the Southern Cross, and we call those the pointers. And the brightest of that is Alpha Centauri. This is the nearest star to us. Now, it's 4.2 light years away. So uh, a light year is kind of how long light takes to travel in a year. It's kind of used as a measuring tool. You can kind of use it as a time in some way. What, what's really important, though, here in astronomy terms is the light that has left that star took 4.2 years to reach us here on Earth. So it left that star four years ago and is only now reaching us here on Earth. So when next week, when Kevin is looking at these stars, they're seeing light as it was emitted four years ago. So they're quite looking back to what that star looked like in 2018. And they'll be using that information to see the properties of the star, the ages, maybe is there an exoplanet around it? This is a big topic in astronomy. Are there other planets around other stars? And Alpha Centauri, that nearest star to us, is a really important target because uh, it is the closest thing that we can possibly have to us to study this, obviously, besides our own solar system. So if we understand how unique our solar system is, what does it mean? Are there other Earth-like planets? You know, this is the question we're always asked. Are there other things living out there? One of the ways to study this is, are there other planets out there? Do they host life? Do they potentially have the right conditions? And one of the best targets to look at is our neighbor star called Alpha Centauri. And you can only do that from space, and you can only really do that by launching from a southern spaceport, the Arnhem Space Center. And so we're going to go start to see uh, now that instrument up close. So we were able to go with Kevin earlier today to see his instrument being prepared, being tested, and ready to see the very technical detail of how do you put a telescope, something that is kind of sensitive, it is, does have glass, we know telescopes all like to break, how do you put a telescope on a rocket, launch it into space, and make sure it comes back in one piece? Well, it's a little bit tricky, and we were able to see Kevin up close to actually see how this all worked. But before we do, I think it's kind of interesting, you know, we, we were just having a few questions real quick, just to remind people. For those people who are tuning in to already see a rocket launching, we did have a 30-minute delay at the beginning of the show. Uh, and again, this is purely normal operations. Uh, so we're now just reached the T minus 27 and counting mark. Uh, so far, that is on track. Uh, for those who were tuning in earlier or watching this pre-recorded, uh, you may have noticed we actually heard some rain above us. Uh, we've been fighting rain on and off a bit throughout the day. Rain is actually not that big of an issue. The winds so far appear to be cooperating, just looking at the person who's making sure everything's on check. Uh, so, so far, the winds are behaving. The rain seems to have mostly stopped. And as of now, we are on track for Australia's first commercial launch and NASA's launch from a first time from a commercial spaceport. So we'll be doing that in hopefully 26 minutes. And as we get closer to the site, we'll be bringing you live images of that rocket taking off for as long as we want. And we'll actually hopefully be talking to some of the people on mission two and three, because once launch one happens tonight, it doesn't stop there. The group starts tomorrow morning for launch two happening on 4 July, and then they get ready for the third team coming on 12 July. So we're gonna go see Kevin now 
in his experiment to see what it actually looks like to have a telescope mounted on a rocket that's going to be coming down via parachute later next week. So if there's a little bit of residual gas in there, uh, you can actually create an arc that goes across the, oh, the small amount yeah. of gas. It'll act like a conductor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if that happens, then uh, things can yes. break down and melt quickly. I can yeah. imagine that. <laughs> so, uh, so there are all sorts of inhibits on here to not let the detector turn on if, it, if it's not at high vacuum. Yep. And we, in fact, we actually, during flight, we put, uh, we take this, when we're, when we're arming the vehicle, we take yep. this plate off and we put a little cheater plug in there mm -hmm. that allows it to override that, that circuit so it will turn on in flight no matter what. Oh, uh, okay. But All then right, it's yeah. very dicey because if somebody accidentally turns it on, it would be very bad. Yeah, So, yeah, okay. so it's like, it's, it's only held safe by humans at that yeah, point, yeah, which gotcha. is a scary thing. Which is always a trick, yeah. yeah. So, so the telescope is here? That's right. So the uh, telescope starts here. It points out this way. Uh, this is what we call the shutter door. Yep. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you see, it's on a, on a, a thread here. Yep. And, in, and there's a hinge down here. Yep. And in flight, on a timer, this motor will run. It'll run the thread down and open the door this way. Okay. And look out, and uh, the telescope will look out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so essentially, this is the bay door that yeah opens up, and then you're looking out this way. That's right. Yeah. So then, is the so the telescope mirror width is maximized? That's right. Yeah, it yeah. takes up the whole <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I assume that was yeah. it. Yeah. It's a it's a full half meter mirror, which is um, yeah. Uh, so this the diameter here is 22 inches. Okay. And the mirror is like 20 and a half inches. Yeah. So okay. It's, it's as big as we could possibly go. I wanted to make these measurements of Alpha Sen, and we realized that uh, you know we couldn't have done it with previous technology that you could have put on a rocket. Yep. And so we said, ah, oh, okay, well actually, if we use these advanced technologies, we can build this instrument that will have you know, throughput 15 times greater than what we'd ever been able to do before, and we can actually do this science even on a rocket payload. Yeah. Um, and so we just you know built it all together. Nice. Yeah. Well, look, it's. So far, it seems like it's tracking well, at least. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, this is also the um, this is the second science flight. We did a, a test science flight uh, to observe an F-type star in November of last year at from White Sands. Sands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NASA did not want this to be the first flight of uh, these payloads. Interesting. Okay. Yes, they wanted they wanted payloads that had a high probability uh, of scientific success. success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which I completely understand. Yeah. No, you under, you don't want three missions that go up and don't give data because. That's yeah. right. <laughs> this this was a big investment, and so we wanted to make sure that we got the bang for the buck. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it so. makes sense, right? I mean, because it has not just been you guys coming here; it has been the whole everything. enterprise. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Which it, has it, been fantastic. Which normally you're just dealing with the individual experiment, right? In terms of, uh, especially operating from the U.S., we're here for these three missions. It is, yeah, the whole enterprise of the facilities, right. getting him here. Exactly, yeah, and, and when we launch in the US, we basically just plugging our experiment into a process that yeah. is already happening. Yeah. Here, we've created the process. Yes, exactly. And so, um, it's just a, you know, a much bigger undertaking, and um, so we wanted to make sure that We'd work the kinks out. Yeah, no, I understand. Did you get data on the, on the did, first it flight? Was, it was beautiful, yeah. We have a, a, my former grad school, and my almost to defend uh, grad student now is back at home writing the paper on nice. this uh, cool. data. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 22 so, minutes. So that is kind of the second payload that we'll start to see um, up close. Um, well, not for this launch, but on a second launch uh, on 4 July. We'll then have the third launch on 12 July. Now, obviously, we weren't able to quite show uh, the first experiment. That's because it was already loaded to the rocket. And once it's integrated with the rocket, that's what you're seeing here on the launch pad. This is the integrated rocket. Now, you can just make out the gantry. That is the metal support structure on the left. Uh, so that is actually what's holding the rocket in place. Now, this is a sounding rocket. Now. Uh, what we mean by sounding rocket is uh, it goes into orbit, but it doesn't do a full orbit around the Earth. Uh, you can also see a few of the raindrops still on the camera from that beautiful dry season rain we had earlier, but it will be blown off when that rocket takes off 
Hopefully we still keep the camera, but that's someone else's problem. Now, as that rock, rocket takes off on the right, you can see there's actually going to be different stages. And in a little bit, we'll go to an earlier shot that we had today uh, of the rocket on the launch pad uh, during the daytime so we can see the different sections. There are multiple stages to this rocket. There are stages that involve the motor, i.e. the engine getting up. There are stages that just contain the science payload. And that's kind of what we saw uh, in the lab earlier with Kevin. The, that is the part where the telescope, all the electronics, the equipment is. Now the engine part, the motor part, is that first bottom part that you're seeing now uh, attached to the gantry on the left. Um, and again, we apologize for the kind of distortion of rain, uh, rain uh, on the lens, but that's what's happened with the rain, and we can't obviously have anyone down there to dry it off uh, because it is a working site, and they are preparing for launch now just under 20 minutes. So we originally were scheduled for a launch 10 minutes ago, uh, but that was pushed back through a 30-minute delay. Again, fairly normal. There's been no other changes or issues to this. Um, it is a normal check that they do because this whole countdown is an eight hour process. Uh, so sometimes during that countdown, you have to make sure things are double checked. Again, safety and success is the priority of Equatorial Launch Australia and NASA for this mission. So that means sometimes you just have to delay things. Um, but luckily, it's only 20 minutes to go, not even that, before we see this launch take place. Now, um, when you look at this rocket, what you'll see is when it launches from our shots that you'll be seeing later, it will be launching towards the southwest. So as viewed from now, it's going to be going slightly off screen to the right. Now we'll have further cameras back that will follow up for as long as we can. Now, this rocket actually does move fairly fast because it is a small sounding rocket. It does actually move quite quickly, accelerating on that initial go. Now, sounding rockets are actually quite common. Um, we're kind of used to these giant rockets, but a lot of these missions at places like NASA Wallops facility, who is the partner with Equatorial Launch Australia, they're the customer here launching this rocket or having the rocket launched, they do launch from all over. They've launched from Alaska, White Sands, New Mexico, Asfalgard in Sweden, uh, and almost everywhere in between. This is their first commercial launch anywhere, though. Usually when they've launched, it's been a government or national or military facility, so to speak, something not operated purely by a commercial entity. And I think that is part of the, the story and legacy about what we're seeing tonight. And that is Equatorial Launch Australia's vision was if you build it, they will come. If you build a great facility that has all the requirements for what a rocket wants, you will have customers like NASA wanting to come to your facility. Now, it's not easy. When you build a spaceport, you have to have a few different bits of infrastructure. You need to have communications. You need to have data. You need to have electricity, power, places to houses. You know, you're building in somewhere that is one of the remote locations not just in Australia, but probably in, in the world, and you're building some of the most sophisticated experiments that scientists and engineers can do. Now, one of the great things about that is it prevents and gives unique possibilities. It prevents interesting challenges as well. And I think the team here at Equatorial Launch Australia has been working around the clock to make sure this facility is up to scratch, to make sure everything possibly that you can think of, rethink of, check and recheck, is done to make sure this launch has happened. And to make sure that when that rocket launches in now under 17 minutes, that when it goes up, the scientists, when they take over at 100 seconds, because that's the rough timeline, 100 seconds in, as the rocket's gone up, that's when science starts. That's when you start to reach enough altitude that the science can happen. Now, for those who didn't hear, the rocket will reach a peak altitude of about 350 kilometers. That's the plan apogee or height of the mission. Once there, that's when all of the science happens. Now afterwards, after that rocket goes up, uh, the bits of the sounding rocket experiment will come back down. They will be parachuted safely back down to Australia. Uh, and this is part of the checks and work that Equatorial Launch Australia has to do. As this thing's happening, happening you need to keep track of it. You can't just say, ah, rocket went up, that's fine. No. That doesn't work. You actually have to figure out where it's going, where it's going to land. You have to recover it. Now, part of this story is that when you're working with this,
They are working with so many different people. Yes, they're working with NASA. Yes, they're working with the scientists. Yes, they're working with the team here. You have people from the Australian Space Agency making sure everything's working. From CASA, the Civilization uh, Authority for Airplane Traffic. Uh, you have local emergency services making sure that everything is done possibly to keep people safe. This is an entire community, both local and Australia effort, to see how space in Australia is changing. You know, if you thought five years ago, would we be here to see a NASA rocket launching from Arnhem Land? You know, it was a vision that people had, but was it really going to happen? Uh, hard to say, but now it is. And I think this is an amazing thing. We're seeing so much growth in space. We have other companies as well. Southern, um, Southern uh, launch in the southern part of Australia, looking to launch from the Eyre Peninsula near Port Lincoln. You have Gilmore Space in Queensland. You have Fleet Technologies in Adelaide looking at building satellite Skycraft. You have university missions. You have so many activity happening in Australia right now. This is kind of the symbol of what's happening, is that we are now starting to launch rockets for NASA. I mean, I think that's just kind of an amazing thing to be able to think of when people dream of what is going into space, what is happening. It is now happening here in Australia. When you're thinking about what can you study at university, if you're choosing math or physics or engineering, you can do that. But the science of actually getting a rocket into orbit is more than just the rocket itself. And I like to emphasize that point. There are people here from so many different backgrounds and skill sets to make this happen. And this is the broader part of it. Can you build a rocket company and not know anything about economics? I'm an astronomer, that's my background. I like to study supernova. I only have to be accurate to within about a billion years. That doesn't make for a very good job in other cases if I have to say your bank account's good to within a billion dollars. I probably wouldn't keep a job. You need those people to be accurate. You need those people to be skilled. So you have so many different people from so many different backgrounds and skill sets from all over Australia, quite literally, there are people from Ballarat, Melbourne, local, Darwin, and anywhere in between, making sure that this launch has had all the equipment necessary to be successful. And one of the part of that story is working with the traditional owners of the land. Now, we heard at the beginning from Jarwa, and he was a, a young man, and he is one of the traditional owners. And space, as I said, in Australia, isn't starting today, it started 60,000 years ago. And this mission builds on the legacy of people who have lived on this continent for so long and quite literally observed changes in the sky with their own eyes. And they're now gonna be part of the story going forward. And what that means, not just for space, not just for NASA, not just for the science that is just happening for this single experiment, but for the people who have lived here and are going to be part of that story for decades to come. And so we're going to hear from them now. So I'm here with Jawa. Thanks for joining and having us here. Where are we? And uh, you know, we know we're at a rocket launch site, but this is the traditional country of the Yolanu people, correct? It is. It is the traditional country for my clan, the Gumach. Yep. yep. And we're at a place called Korkula. Korkula, okay. Yeah. Uh, and how... I mean, this is, actually, this is actually a big country over here compared to some of the other countries throughout Australia, right? I mean, I think a lot of people view it as just, there's just one, but there's actually a lot of country and a lot of clans out here, aren't there? Uh, here, there are about 13 clan groups. Okay, yep. I'm one of the, my clan is one of the, uh, the 13 clan groups. Yep. Much. Okay. And so you've been working with Equatorial Launch Australia? Yes, we have. You know, we, you know, when the moment came for the scientists to come and talk to us. We just thought it, it would be a great idea to uh, get something like this into looking at how our f future would roll out. Yeah, so you, know, so, so you see this is kind of a, a great future for the local people here. It is, absolutely, because uh, the mine here won't last long in yep. another couple of years, I guess. And, uh, but seeing that we... Uh, have talked to Eli and NASA about uh, the rocket or the space center here. It, yep. it brings that, um, you know, the, especially about the town, if it is to fade away or die, yep. we have hopes that it will stay alive. So, so this is kind of yeah, the, the future, yeah, yeah that, that life support almost of working with other groups to, 
take the next step for well, the people here? The next step is that, like it's the future. Yeah. Not, on, not only for us, yep. the whole town, yep. and for whatever, you know, the, uh, the potential of uh, the scientists coming and working amongst the Yolongo people here, especially the Gumach. Yep. Mm. And, and I think that's the beautiful thing, as, as, as you just said, right? Working with and amongst, it's not working for that and th this is the I think the beauty of what's kind of being formed out of the Artem Space Center right is is this partnership to grow not just space in Australia not just space in the US but space here yeah, and that, that beauty of it that's right eh? because my my tribe the Gumach yep. are always in the lookout for you know we look over the horizons yep. and uh, see what we can you know utilize our country to be able to use it in a way that it can become, you know, economy-wise yep. kind of a, um, thoughts that we always have. And so, yeah, you get to drive this, the economy drivers, and I think this is beautiful connection. You know, I, I love standing amongst this beautiful mm. red dirt. And then we think about, you know, connecting to the skies, right? And that's quite literally what is happening here. That's right, because, you know, we, you know, with uh, NASA and ELA and... Um, we like to work, you know, this is the only way that we can work in collaboration with you know, scientists yep. as Yolonga people because yep. Yolonga people, especially us and another clan groups, we tend to not forget about the stars yeah. in our kind of dreamings and all that. Yeah. Mm. And, and, you know, if you're just thinking, you know, this is the first, obviously, of three launches scheduled, but... What is the hope for the future? Are, are, do you hope and, and does your clan hope that this becomes just a bigger business industry so you have multiple launches happening? I'd like to see that in the future. And if, and if uh, like NASA or ELA want to expand all this, yep. we are happy. I mean, I think that's a beautiful thing because I, I think by, you know, I'm obviously not from here. I'm from Nanawal country down in cold Canberra, enjoying the beautiful warmth of the sun for once. And and I think this is the thing is being able to also have other people come and appreciate the beautiful country out here. Mm. You know, you have people from the U.S. and all over, all over Australia. You know, and I think as multiple launches happen, is, the, is there that possibility of that bigger growth, not just for the science, but for tourism and people learning about the place and the beautiful country out here? Yes, especially with tourism, you know, we are uh, good much people are in the early stages of uh, tourism being out here, but other clan groups have opened their country for tourism but, and uh, the the uh, Arnhem Space Centre here yep. is, would be the ideal place for tourism in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I, I could just dream and think about, you know, kids and people from all over on school holidays saying, Let's go up to the Artem Space Center and watch a lo rocket launch and enjoy the beautiful country up there. Mm. And uh, like, you know, the school holidays have started already. Yep. And uh, the kids are always asking me at my community, yep. Hey, Java, when do we go out and look at the rocket <laughs> take off? You know? <laughs> so, is there, so is a lot of the, uh, the group in the town are going to come out and watch the launch from a safe distance? Yeah. But, you know, like, you know, better be in the safe distance rather than being in, you know, where the actual, um, the launch will take place. Sometimes, yes, it's nice to appreciate beauty from afar rather yeah, than... Ra <laughs> rather ra than, rather than being here in, a, <laughs> in the middle of it. <laughs> but, well, look, you know, I, I think it is, it's great that, you know, you, you've, you've welcomed and opened everyone up to being here and, mm. and, and working with you on developing this amazing, I think, potential for, 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 for everyone, as we just said. Yeah, but, you know, like, my... my uh, my thanks is to the Northern Territory government, okay. the Australian government, yep. and even if I have to say thank you to the the, the American government as well as. <laughs> Sometimes we have to. Yes, we have to. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, is there, you know, on this process, I mean, has it been one that's taken a while? Yeah. You know, or you know, does it ha does it happen overnight? You know, I think people view it as this quick process but I imagine yeah, it's taken some work. It has taken time especially with you know, the consultations that have taken place yeah. with the local statutory body the Northern Land Council. Yep. You know, they have been to a couple of places and uh, looked at uh, uh, the other communities yep. in how this will affect those. Um, okay. Uh, but, but all of them have come back saying we've 
supported all this. I, I think this is great. You know, it, it's that it is this really this this country national effort to make this happen. Uh, and hopefully we'll see, you know, a beautiful launch take place. Uh, one of many that will happen here at the Arnhem Space Center. Mm. But, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking forward to all this. Yep. And uh, especially my my uh, clan, the Gumach. Yep. And so there, there kind of is this excitement and buzz, I guess, across. All around. Hey, yeah. In the town of Nulunbui, yep. everything's a buzz, Yirkala, and Ski Beach, where I come from. Okay. Mm. What I, what I, what I think would, could be almost remarkable to think about is, you know, a rocket taking off, going to Mars, connecting, a, you know, one beautiful red country to the red planet, you know, and I think that's one of the potential that this site offers everyone. You know, you know, it is possible Yep. if we have that uh, feeling towards the, uh, the potential of rockets going up to Mars. Yep. This is the place. This is the place. Mm, this is the place. And this may be the first start of that place. This is only the beginning of a new beginning. The new beginning. I love it. Yep. And so it was great to really chat to Java earlier in this launch. Now, as you may be hearing, the rain has returned. Now, this is not stopping the launch as of yet. We are still just four minutes and 35, almost 30 seconds uh, from this launch. Now, one of the reasons why the rain sounds so heavy here is just the nature of the roof. It is not necessarily as pouring as it weighs may seem, though I'm obviously inside and not outside in the red rain. I will keep talking as loud as we can to keep going. Now, we are still at the countdown as we're going. We have not changed this procedure. It all depends on the rain and it all depends on what the wind is doing. The countdown is still going. Uh, they are still now just approaching four minutes. Now, hopefully this rain won't last very long. They may have to cut it. So generally what they will do is pause at three minutes if there has to be a delay due to small bits of rain. So we will keep going probably at least until three minutes. We will tune into launch control to see uh, is it delayed or not. Now, weather delays are a natural part of the beauty of launching a rocket. It happens uh, anywhere. It happens in Florida. It can happen anywhere. Look, if we're going to consider the positive, the rocket's going to be nice and clean. Now, <laughs> it's sounding very heavy in here. Now. People may have noticed, I'm a tad excited by this. Now, uh, I am a scientist. Uh, my specialty is looking at stars that explode and how uh, the universe evolves. Hey, the rain's stopping. There you go. That's the great thing about the weather. I am excited to see this rocket. I have never seen a rocket in person. I've seen videos. I've seen stuff happen from rockets launched into space. I've never seen it here personally. We're stopped. So we have now just stopped at three minutes, so we will pause the counter. Now, again, this hold is purely due to the local weather. There hasn't been any changes uh, in anything to do with the technical side of the rocket. There hasn't anything to do with the uh, nature side of the rocket. Um, and so, yeah, we will pause the countdown in a second, but we are on hold at three minutes. Um, so we will reset the counter to three minutes, and this is purely due to the weather. Now, the great thing about the way the weather is happening here is it's not like there's a massive storm that is happening repeatedly. Uh, there does appear to be local pockets of just rain coming about. Uh, so it's a mixture of rain, obviously, that they're worried about, but the wind. Um, now, one of the things that will happen is there is a launch window for this. So it's a three hour launch window. Uh, so we do still have plenty of time to see this. So as long as the weather essentially subsides at some point, uh, we'll be okay. Now, you can't really see that much outside. We can see a bit of the glow of the clouds and a bit of the um, glow of the rocket. Uh, but you do notice that there are some raindrops on the camera. Well, it is outside to catch the launch of the rocket. You can just see the light uh, bit of the base there. Now, again, for those who are just turning in, this is a sounding rocket. Uh, so the rocket is 22 meters in length. It's about two tons. Uh, the experiment it's carrying is an X-ray measurement uh, to look at the X-ray gas from our Milky Way galaxy. 
Now, one of the great things that we were able to do is to get up close to this rocket. Uh, and this happened earlier today. And this was actually really momentous because, you know, to build a rocket, you don't just put it on a piece of dirt. There is a huge what we call launch pad. This is where the rocket launches from. This had to be bolted meters over 14 meters into the ground, had to be secure because as that rail goes up, as it's already in its position, as the rocket is up and ready to go into its position, you need to make sure it is secure. You need to make sure that it is safe. And you need to make sure that gusts of wind don't knock it over. The last thing you want is a gust of wind or anything to, like that to knock it down. So one of the other parts that was quite momentous yesterday was the full dress rehearsal. So we said the countdown started almost eight hours ago. Now it's actually closer to nine with these weather delays. Yesterday, there was a dress rehearsal of eight hours. This is the process it takes to make sure everything is operating smoothly from a technical side, an engineering side, weather, safety, checks, you name it, they had to do it. And what was special about yesterday was as the rocket went from its vertical lying position to its or horizontal lying position, rather, to its vertical straight up and down position, all of the team, the ELA team who's been working weeks nonstop to months and years. The NASA team who has come out here, all 70 plus personnel from NASA Wallops facility, plus the science teams from University of Colorado at Boulder and the University of Wisconsin who have been here for, again, weeks to make this happen, are here and have been here. And they were finally able to come together on site. And so this was an amazing thing to be able to witness, to have everyone coming on site to be able to see what it was like and actually to see the rocket up close. And so we're going to go now to this previously recorded vision. So this is again from the end of the dress rehearsal yesterday when all of the teams were outside and everyone was excited to see, well, a rocket up close that was about to take off because we're only three minutes from when we resume uh, the countdown. Again, we are on a three minute hold. Um, they were excited to see it up close and personal. So we're at the rocket launch site right behind me. So the rocket is now into its vertical position. So what you have to do is obviously the rocket starts lying down in the shed, gets into the launch position, ready for takeoff. So we're at the dress rehearsal now, but it'll be put into position tonight for the launch and soon it will take off. Yeah. So that was a little bit of the rocket up close, but we have actually plenty of vision um, that we shot from near it. Now, the rocket, as we were kind of seeing uh, when we went into the PIF, as it's called, uh, this is the um, facility where the uh, instruments are stored. Um, there are multiple stages to the rocket. So you first have the bottom rocket motor uh, on the bottom. Now, this is the, the workhorse of the rocket. This is when you think of rocket, this is that bit. This is the engine that obviously will take it into space um, and go from there. Um, launch control, as you're seeing now, um, there are a number of people squeezed in this room. Now, we're obviously not there now um, because, well, uh, they're a little bit busy with this weather. Now, you're also starting to get a feel from the site. It's amazing to actually be here on this beautiful red dirt. You know, this is, I think, that unique feel of Australia is you have the beautiful red earth beneath us. Uh, and I kind of like that idea that one day in the future, we may have a rocket leaving this beautiful red dirt going to the beautiful red dirt of Mars, for instance. Now, uh, as you're actually seeing that building on the left, that's where we're broadcasting from. Uh, down the road, you can see at the end, uh, you can see the rail uh, just in that previous shot uh, of where the rocket was. Now. This is what it's like right now. Uh, obviously, we're in the nighttime, but this is the position of the rocket. It's in its vertical position. Uh, so it comes out of the housing, uh, moving from that horizontal to vertical position, being locked into place. Uh, and it really was momentous yesterday when all of the team uh, was able to uh, get there and see it up close and personal. Uh, and, it, you know, when you, when you have a rocket launch, there is a huge amount of people who have to make it happen. 
And when you look at the different parts of this, you have the engine, you have the motor, uh, as you're seeing. So you have the rocket on the left, or the right, rather, the gantry, the support structure on the left. You have the science payload, as you're seeing in the middle, going to um, the top. This is the bit of the rocket that makes the rocket what it is. And some of the people you're seeing are these people who have been working nonstop, I think it's fair to say for weeks to months in some cases, making sure of it. Sometimes you have to get underneath the uh, pier of the rocket to uh, make sure everything's working. Um, uh, and it normally it um, uh, is a smooth sailing operation. Now, we are in a T minus three minute hold. Uh, again, we are purely in a weather delay hold. Now, we are in the Northern Territory. We're at the Artem Space Center, and we're in a place, or a time of place, rather, where we're in the dry season. This is supposed to be uh, where the weather is fairly consistent day to day, where the temperature is pretty much 28 to 30 degrees Celsius every day and stays like that. Um, that is not the case right now. We've obviously had some rain impact. Now, the rain has stopped. Uh, that is the good thing. When the weather is resumed to be stable again, they will initiate the rest of the countdown. Uh, and this is why you have, um, you have a T minus three minute countdown. This is purely because all of the other checks are here. Everything else um, is uh, ready to go. We're only waiting for the one thing that no one control, but everyone would like to, and that is the weather. You know, one of the things I get to be asked all the time uh, as an astronomer, I use telescopes to look up is, well, can you look through clouds? No, there are so many weather anomalies, we'll call it anomaly, uh, that stops us. Wind, rain, storms. In this case, it is the gusting wind that is blowing in with this rain. Now, again, it has stopped, but there does need to be enough stability to make sure that it is in the safe parameters. And in fact, you can see on the camera, there are a few raindrops on it. Again, keeping in mind this camera is outside because we budgeted for the dry season, um, not the wet season as is apparently turned into this afternoon uh, and evening. Um, but nonetheless, once it is deemed safe. So we have just started count again. That's why we want to see. Now, that is the amazing thing of being in the operation center is when you deem the weather's good, we are good to go. So now we are resume counting. Uh, we are ready to go. And as long as we don't get another storm, um, <laughs> we're going to see a rocket launch. Now, um, what we will be doing um, is for going outside soon uh, to see the rocket launch. So we're going to stay mostly on these shots uh, near the launch pad, uh, and we will be seeing it as it takes off. We'll be then panning to an outside shot um, for the launch taking off, and then obviously as far as we can see it. Um, so as of now, the weather seems stable enough that we're good to go. We've just approached less than two minutes. Uh, we are on track, so we're minute 45. So we've just started another hold. Um, we'll see what that is about. Um, now, again, everything is just making sure that the weather conditions here are stable enough um, for it. Look, you know, it's, imagine it's Christmas, right? It's no good just to open all your presents. Once you want a little bit of anticipation, well, you're getting it here tonight. We said it'd be history in the making. we making sure you're earning it by staying tuned uh, to watch this. Um, now, we do have the current problems with winds. This is where we're at. Um, the official hold time is going to be 2.01. So this is going to be our official time. We will set the count um, based on that clock. Um, we're just making sure everything's syncing together. So we're at a two minute and one second hold. Now, we will keep on that. Um, we will stay at two minutes and one second until we resume it. We won't go back to that three minutes uh, right now. Everything they're doing is just making sure the winds are cooperating. So again, for those who are just tuning in, hoping that the rocket has already taken off, we've been dealing with some storms blowing in during the dry season uh, up here in the Northern Territory, um, waiting for it to, well, subside, essentially. Um, now, as of now, the winds are not dramatic, um, but they are out of 
tolerance for the rocket. So what that means is there is enough gust that the rocket is swaying too much. Now, as we are seeing in those previous shots, uh, the engine and the rocket is mounted to um, the gantry, uh, and that has to be stable. Now, because of the... Now, because of the wind, they're going to reset to three minutes. And again, this is all part of the normal process. And again, the only thing stopping us right now is wind and storm. So for everyone, think good thoughts in Australia. Absorb all of the bad weather here so that we can see this rocket launch and this rocket take off. And again, I mean, you know, we are all excited to see this historic first commercial launch. We're excited to see NASA's first commercial launch from anywhere. So we will be monitoring the weather. They will be saying it. And as soon as, again, the winds are in that tolerable range. So what they're worried about, again, is the gusts. So how much you can gust back and forth. That is the real worry here. Um, this is going to be what is going to prevent or start our count. Now we have a, um, a plenty of time in the launch window. We have a three-hour launch window. Now that is started from our original time to... Uh, which was about an hour ago now. Uh, so we still have at least another not quite two hours to fit the launch in. So there is not necessarily uh, that much of a worry uh, for the rocket not taking off, so to speak. Um, but we're just waiting for that wind to die down. Uh, and once the team at Launch Control Center, that's the building kind of behind us, uh, that will be essentially pressing that button. Once they are ready to go, uh, we will be ready to go. And we will be with you. We will be with you until we get that zero mark. When we hit zero and we see the rocket launch, that's what we all want. That's what I want. That's what you want. That's what the team here wants. You know, there are scientists who have been waiting for their experiments to go up and launch and get their data. And, you know, they've been hanging around for a long time. Uh, they've been long for a bit. Now, one of the things that is, I think, exciting about what uh, we are seeing is really what the science we can expect from some of these missions. And so we're going to go, for those who missed it, we're going to go back and play Kevin. Um, and so Kevin is one of the mission scientists um, that we were able to see and talk to about why did Australia come, or sorry, why did NASA come uh, to see this rocket launch happen? Why did they want to do their science? And why are they setting up here? So we're going to try and go see Kevin again. Again, this is pre-recorded vision. And Kevin is relaxed a bit because right now he's on the second and third mission. Uh, he's just waiting out um, uh, for the first launch to happen so he can see his second and third launch. If there's a little bit of residual gas in there, uh, you can actually create an arc that goes across the, oh, the small amount yeah. of gas. It'll act like a conductor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if that happens, then uh, things can yes. break down and melt quickly. I can yeah. imagine that. <laughs> so if there's a little bit of residual gas in there, uh, you can actually create an arc that goes across the, oh, the small amount yeah. of gas. It'll act like a conductor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if that happens, then well, uh, things we're now can we're doing the count. This is the beauty of trying yeah, to launch a rocket so, uh, uh, in the dry land. So the ro the winds have been deemed to be within the safe region. If, if uh, we are now going to resume it. And now if it's going to be... So when far we're, on track. The vehicle, uh, take this look, plate off and everyone who has been staying there, up for the stream, uh, I really appreciate that, it. That um, so it you know, no what. I am oh, dedicated okay. to seeing this launch happen. I will be here till we get this launch happen. You will be here till we get this launch happen because that's what everyone wants. Now, the count is officially on. We are resuming as we were. Uh, and as of now, the winds are seem to be deemed in the safety range. We're just double checking that aside. But this is the official call, which means if nothing changes, we're only a minute 50 from our very first launch. So if we go back outside to what the rocket is looking at right now, um, there will still be some raindrops on the screen. Uh, that's not surprising. Unfortunately, there is not much we can do at this point. Um, but we have plenty of camera shots that we'll see it. And we will see the launch take place from here. We will also see the further panned out cameras as the launch takes place. So this is going to be our wide shot that you can see. You can see the base of the rocket glowing at the bottom. We're a minute 23. 
And you can really start to feel the buzz and excitement now. Everyone who is in this room right now is abandoning me. I'm being abandoned ship because everyone's going outside to see a rocket launch. This is going to happen. We are just now a minute 10 from Australia's first commercial launch that we have seen. You know, there is a real buzz from everyone running outside, NASA employees, government representatives, uh, the ELA team. So the winds have just popped up again, unfortunately. So we're holding now at 58 seconds. We will see if we resume this countdown. You know this wind. I am going to be happy if I never hear of wind again. I'm going to tell you this right now. So we will reset. We're holding at 58 seconds. Let's hope that the winds keep down enough. Uh, so we're going to reset now to three minutes. So this is the process that once the winds are deemed um, too high, we have to reset to the three minute clock. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is because of the whole process of counting down. Because once the rocket is launched, it obviously has to take off. So the, the worry about the winds is not just for the rocket itself on the launch pad. Uh, it is for as it goes, obviously, into its orbit as in a trajectory. And if the winds are blowing it around too much, it could be blown too far off course. It can limit the payload being reached into orbit. Uh, and this creates a lot of problems. So we're going to restart the countdown back to three minutes. Luckily, we're not going past three minutes at this point. It's just a wind problem. We're going to stay at three minutes for now. And as soon as we can, we will resume the count. Now, uh, I, get, I appreciate everyone being so patient with us. You know, this is the weather. This is what life is like when you're trying to launch a rocket. You know, hey, they say it's rocket science. Um, in fact, on the back of the bottle, it is just rocket science. But what we're doing is we are just waiting. We'll stay on these shots, obviously, for the wide shots. Um, do you want to? So, but what we're going to try and do is at least get a sneak peek back about what Kevin, as we were talking to earlier, <laughs> was excited by. Um, sorry, we are just trying to make sure everyone's at the right three minutes. Oh, thank God, I need a drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if that happens, then uh, things can yes. break down and melt quickly. I can yeah. imagine that. So, uh, so there are all sorts of inhibits on here to not let the detector turn on if, it, if it's not at high vacuum. Yep. And we, in fact, we actually, during flight, we put, uh, we take this, when we're, when we're arming the vehicle, we take yep. this plate off and we put a little cheater plug in there mm -hmm. that allows it to override that, that circuit so it will turn on in flight no matter what. Oh, uh, okay. But all then right, it's yeah. very dicey because if somebody accidentally turns it on, it would be very bad. Yeah, So, okay. so it's like... It's, it's only held safe by humans at that yeah, point, yeah, which gotcha. is a scary thing. Which is always a trick, yeah. yeah. So, so the telescope is here? That's right. So the uh, telescope starts here. It points out this way. Uh, this is what we call the shutter door. Yep. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you see, it's on a, on a, a thread here. Yep. And, in, and there's a hinge down here. Yep. And in flight, on a timer, this motor will run. It'll run the thread down and open the door this way. Okay. And look out, and uh, the telescope will look out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so essentially, this is the bay door that yeah opens up, and then you're looking out this way. That's right. Yeah. So then, is the so the telescope mirror width is maximized? That's right. Yeah, it yeah. takes up the whole <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I assume that was yeah. it. Yeah. It's a it's a full half meter mirror, which is um, yeah. Uh, so this the diameter here is 22 inches. Okay. And the mirror is like 20 and a half inches. Yeah. So okay. It's, it's as big as we could possibly go. We wanted to make these measurements of Alpha Sen, and we realized that uh, you know we couldn't have done it with previous technology that you could have put on a rocket. Yep. And so we said, ah, oh, okay, well actually, if we use these advanced technologies, we can build this instrument that will have you know, throughput 15 times greater than what we'd ever been able to do before, and we can actually do this science even on a rocket payload. Yeah. Um, and so we just you know built it all together. Nice. Yeah. Well, look, it's. So far, it seems like it's tracking well, at least. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, this is also the um, this is the second science flight. We did a, a test science flight uh, to observe an F-type star in November of last year. At from White Sands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NASA did not want this to be the first flight of uh, these payloads. 
Interesting. Okay. Yes, they wanted they wanted payloads that had a high probability uh, of scientific success. success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which I completely understand. Yeah, no, you under, you don't want three missions that go up and don't give data because that's yeah. right. <laughs> this this was a big investment, and so we wanted to make sure that we got the bang for the buck. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that makes sense, right? I mean, because it has not just been you guys coming here; it has been the whole everything. enterprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Which it, has been fantastic. Which normally you're just dealing with the individual experiment, right, in terms of, uh, especially operating from the U.S., we're here for these three missions, it is, yeah, the whole enterprise of the facilities right. getting them here. Exactly, yeah, and, and when we launch in the U.S., we're basically just plugging our experiment into a process that yeah. is already happening. Yeah. Here, we've created the process. Yes, exactly. And so, um, it's just a, you know, a much bigger undertaking, and um, so we wanted to make sure that We'd work the kinks out. Yeah, no, I understand. Did you get data on the on it the did, first flight? It, it was beautiful. Yeah, we have a, a my former grad well, my almost to defend uh, grad student now is back at home, writing the paper on nice. that cool. uh, data. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, awesome. Forty. So, if you've just seen, we have resumed the count, uh, and that is because yes, the winds have now become um, well stable again. So we're going to try and see if we can do this again. And I appreciate everyone. Yes, I need a drink. I'm only fortunately drinking water because my voice is very sore. But you can do as much as you want at home. Hopefully we don't have to go back to that three minute game. So we are now just 70 seconds away from the launch. We will be going outside as you're seeing now to see this. So as long as the wind stable, for the next two minutes, essentially, or at least the next minute, this rocket is launching off. Now, I know I've said that before. So we are officially now under the minute count. We are still going. Uh, we are still. Yep, so we are still at 44 seconds, as you're seeing. So we will stay outside for the shots. We will keep it as much as we can. And we are going to see a rocket take off from Australia. 30 seconds. Now, the fact that we are having a rocket take off from Australia is just as, I, I, I cannot wait to see 20 seconds from now this rocket take off. So we have now held again. So I am sorry for this fun game. I promise we are not playing a trick on you. The winds are playing a trick on us. We were so close. We were so close. We will get there again, but we will see. So we are on a hold. Um, if it is a wind hold, we'll go back to three minutes. If it's something like that, so we are going back to three minutes yet again. For those who suggested drinking every time you hear three minutes, I suggest taking a drink as well. Now, I'm obviously just drinking water, but in order to wet my whistle so well, I'm going to keep being with you until we sing take off. Look, at least we're getting closer every time, right? You know, we're slowly inching and inching and inching. And look, again, this is quite uncharacteristic, you know, this is the dry season of the Northern Territory. We are not really expecting rain. We are not really expecting wind. And you know what? I'm glad you're having fun with this. Look, this is what it's about. We are having fun. We are excited. I'm still going to be excited. Um, and I look, I'm trying to keep up to date with all your comments. I could be playing a trick on you. We could just be looping this. We could be a slight Truman Show type thing. But no, this is real. The rocket is still on the launch pad. We are still ready to launch. We are just holding for T minus three minutes um, and uh, waiting for the winds to go. And I'm kind of actually just being laughed at at this point. One second. Oh, we were just seeing if we were getting resume countdown. We're not. So again, this is just um, all allowed for uh, the wind variation on the rocket relative to the gantry. So we're just checking on the timing to make sure. Yeah, yeah so we're still going to be at three minutes. We're just making sure. Um, so it is science. It is rocket science. It is weather. It is patience. It is excitement. It is everything. 
Thank you for everyone for staying with us. Again, so our launch window, uh, we had a three hour launch window. We still have plenty of time in this launch window. And I am going to be here until we see a rocket launch. I am not leaving this room until I am strapped to something. Maybe it's a rocket. Maybe it's someone dragging me out. We are seeing a rocket take off tonight. We are excited. We are ready. We will get the weather cooperating. Um, so we're going. Yeah. So the official count, we're just being informed. We did get to officially eight seconds, but we had to restart to three minutes. And again, this is all just the. So we're just doing. Copy that. Confirming balloon test. Thank you. So we're just, so NASA has decided, so what they're doing is a balloon test. So now the idea here is they actually want to just make sure they test uh, that higher level wind to make sure it's all performing uh, as expected. Because um, again, it's all about the winds. It's all about the safety. It's all about that. So now because of this, because they want to be extra secure that they know what the wind is doing, that they know that the wind is going to be stable for at, we're going to unfortunately have to go back to a longer countdown. So we're now going to go back to T minus 10 minute countdown. We're going backwards in time. Now, this is purely to make sure that the wind is doing what it's doing, that it is cooperating and that we're doing it. So, yes. So those who are saying that we're going to be doing a balloon test, um, we are going to um, uh, be setting it up. And for all of you who are keeping their kids up to watch this, uh, I live in Canberra, which is a half hour behind uh, in a very cold place. Uh, I know my kids are watching right now. So you know what? Stay up. It's fine. Your teachers can deal with you in the morning. It's not my problem. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be waiting. This is a momentous occasion. This is Australia. This is history. Uh, and, you know, we're going to be waiting here to make this happen. Now, one of the things that we are going to do uh, is it was great to be able to see and interview some of the people on site. We were able to see the science. Yep. So what we're doing, so just getting the official tech. So we're going to still stay at the T minus, T minus three countdown. So that's the official countdown. And the way procedure starts is we're just waiting for 10 minutes. And again, this is what we're doing is NASA is going to be launching uh, a balloon up getting ready uh, to test those higher level winds. Um, and so what we're really waiting for is just to make sure everything's cooperating. Look, and for those who maybe this is your first launch, maybe this is your hundredth. This is common. We often get weather delays for places. One of the great reasons why people wanted to come to the Arnhem Space Center uh, is because hopefully you can get something called the dry season. Well, the dry season is making every single person at the facility work for this launch to make sure um, what is going to happen and to make sure they earn that rocket launch happen. And this journey has been happening for a long time. Uh, and we caught up with, with Michael earlier in the day, who is the chairman and CEO um, of Equatorial Launch Australia. Um, he really was um, instrumental uh, in getting this facility to happen. And hearing the story about how you go um, from an idea of building a rocket to now getting a rocket almost ready to launch. We're almost ready to launch. It's a kind of an amazing story. And so I just want to play back that story, that interview that we had a chat with Michael. Uh, and because it's an important one, when we think about where we are, how remote we are, what is this vision is, it means a lot not just for ELA, but it means a lot for Australia as well. Uh, and this is a sort of amazing thing to happen. So look, we are going to earn it. We're going to make it. Uh, and yeah, uh, for those who are counting, when we get to those final 10 seconds, I am going to be louder than anyone can tolerably imagine because I'm going to be excited to see the final 10 seconds happen. Now, so we are, as we said, in this T minus three, T minus three minute hold rather, but we're in this hold for a few minutes while NASA launches a weather balloon. Now, unfortunately, we just don't have any vision or data from that. So we will wait to hear until NASA says so. But we are going to catch up with Michael, who we interviewed earlier in the day. Hi. I'm Michael Jones, the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive of Equatorial Launch Australia. And tonight, we're doing Australia's first space launch from here in Arnhem Land. 
So watch this coverage and you will see the first commercial rocket launched into space from Australia and the first time that NASA has ever launched from a commercial spaceport um, ever. So here with Michael on what is I'd say a momentous occasion today is a, a small way of describing it. Yep, every interview so far has asked me how's the excitement level. <laughs> have had no excitement, just been too busy. <laughs> but today, starting to get a little bit of a vibe of oh, today's a day, so the excitement level is, is increasing a bit. So that's good, because I want to enjoy it. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the thing, right? I mean, because yeah. this process has been not just the past few weeks or past few months, this process has been quite literally years in the making. Uh, this has been an exercise of 7,000 cuts. Yeah. Um, we submitted the start of our uh, launch license about almost two years ago to the day. Yep. Um, that's been a, a long, arduous process. Um, the building of the site here and doing anything in a remote location yeah. is challenging. Um, and of course, if you're going to be in an industry, in an industry sector, let's pick one that's really sort of nice and simple, like space. Okay? Yeah, exactly. So, it doesn't need any sort of technology. No, at no, all. no, no. That's right. <laughs> and you don't need to find people who know anything. Right? Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So we've had some challenges, and it's been a long road. But um, you know, despite like feeling on yeah. occasions that every roadblock in the world's been put in front of us. You know, we've got here, it's a great day, and, and you know, we are starting to get excited about it. And, and I think there, there's just a buzz that you're starting to see amongst, as they said, not just you, but everyone who seems to be working here. You know, there are people who have been, you know, we were talking to somebody who's been working here on site for the past, you know, 12 weeks. He's like, I just want to see the launch tonight, right? You know, I just want to get to that moment. Yeah, I don't think we did it on purpose, yeah. but I think what you do is you leverage what the end game is all the way through these things. So everybody starts to get a feel for, yeah, I want to get to the end and I want to see, you know, what this is all about. And what's a really interesting dynamic is the mix of, you know, the 75 years of experience of NASA yeah. and all the people who are just insanely professional. They're mm. so good at what they do. I mean, and, and, and they're so regimented and, I mean, rehearsed. Some and... could say inflexible, but uh, <laughs> let's just say they're very structured in what they do. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of it, it's us. You know, we're, we're here, we're sponges. We're trying to soak up every bit yeah. that we can from them. And you could not want, as a startup company, to have a better launch customer, pardon the pun, you know, it's pretty hard to do these conversations without you know working in this <laughs> space and, <laughs> and the launch customer. But, that's but anyway, part of the job. That's the beauty of the job, yeah, right? It's the yeah, puns. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we couldn't have yeah. a better customer to start off with because of both reputation, skill, and just their generosity of passing on information mm. and working with us. And at the end of the day, you know, um, there's this one guy who has to finally decide are we going to launch it? Yeah. That guy looks like me. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I have to remind them of that occasionally. <laughs> and, it, and it's also the, not the responsibility just to the people on the site uh, or NASA or the science payloads. It's, you know, in some degree, the entire community, as you know, we've talked about, uh, yeah. who's been invested in this. Huge span of stakeholders from, you know, the Northern Territory government yeah. have been really instrumental in getting us off the ground, um, all the way through to all the different... Um, traditional owner yes. um, and indigenous groups who we want to engage with but we have to engage with because we're on their land yeah. and in, specifically for these three missions the payloads are landing back on their yep. land so yep. we have to coordinate with them and there's then the absolute myriad of interagency things that yeah. you need to do from explosive ordnance, environment, um, transport, aviation, uh, maritime. Could, could, could you have people around CASA, the space agency, safety, sight rangers? You know, it's not just rockets. You know, this is going to be the first commercial launch in Australia. Uh, and, and that means a lot for the Australian space industry, not just ELA. Yeah. Um, as I've travelled around the globe in the last sort of 12 months, talking to all the major players in the space world, one of the things that has really struck me is there are Australians everywhere. Yeah. And so, to some degree, bringing that home and showing that we have a capability yeah, yeah, here, right. and this is our coming out party in a big way, um, and to show that Australian technology and innovation and entrepreneurship yep. can, you know, be at the forefront of the world stage in space yeah. is a big state. Um, and I think that there are a lot of other great Australian companies yeah, in space. There is. But, you know, the fleet technologies yep. who are doing uh, satellites, the Skycraft in Canberra yep. doing satellites. Who will hopefully have another launch this year. Yeah, That's right. and Myota, 
Um, yep. You know, Southern Launch, our launch partners yep. who are coming up tonight, which is really nice. That's right, and hoping to have that, you know, this kind of same facility, but in the south, and that's the beauty of it is this isn't just representing this site, it is what Australia is going to become. Um, but certainly with Southern Space, we talk to it, Southern Launch, sorry, we uh, yeah. talk to them all the time. We get on yeah. really well with them um, because we have common problems, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and common challenges. So we try to help each other out where we can, and I'm a big believer in, you know, the sum of the parts is always going to be, yeah. you know, the best part of it. And so, you know, let, let's, 10 years, we have a first launch tonight. Yep. What do you think Arnhem Space Center looks like in 10 years? Well, where we're standing at the moment is on what I would call, you know, site one. Yep. Yeah, the end of the first phase, which gives us the ability to do medium-sized rockets. Yep. So up to about 450 to 500 kilos in payload. Yep. The rocket itself sitting on the pad can be up to, you know, 200,000 kilos yep. sitting on the... So, so reasonably large. This is site one. Yep. Um, immediately, you know, a kilometre you know, to our east here yeah. is site two, and we will eventually have, you know, the drawing at the moment has 24 pads on it. Yep. Um, it has to be very carefully planned yeah. so that we can do a launch effectively every six to nine days. Yep. And so tonight, it's all happening tonight, right? Yep. We're now inside the countdown. Um, we started the countdown at eight hours before launch. Yep. Um, there's a whole bunch of activities. It's incredibly detailed and scripted what happens, the number of checks, the number of players, there's over 100 people on site. Um, all extraneous, non-required people are off site for safety. Um, but they're working through the checks, they're rehearsing you know, as they go and then executing. We have to have a huge amount of external communications mm. as well. So airspace, maritime, um, local emergency services, coordinating with security. Um, just talking to everybody else on site. Because it's still it. a rocket that is being launched tonight, right? That's Absolutely. the thing. Absolutely. You know, we're about to fire a projectile um, <laughs> that's going 300 kilometres into space. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's coming back to exactly where we want it. <laughs>Now the idea here is to have the weather balloon go up, test the local winds, because again, what we're worried about and what NASA in particular is worried about for this rocket is not just the winds on the top of the gantry of the rocket as we're looking at, but as it goes into orbit. So these balloons obviously can go tens of kilometers into orbit to actually test what is the winds above and below. But now the key here is the whole rocket is obviously going to a height of 350 kilometers. So in order to do that, they need to test up to as high as they possibly can to make sure it's stable enough for those winds. Now, we still haven't had the rain, even though we still have winds or droplets on our sc screen here. Now, for those who asked, we cannot go near the rocket site. No one can go near it uh, that close where this camera is. It is closer even than people almost would want. So there's unfortunately no way of cleaning it. We will just deal with it as is. Some of the other shots uh, are a little bit better. So we're still going to stay at it. We're still going to wait for the measurements for the weather balloon. This will give us the critical data that NASA needs to make those decisions, uh, to make decisions on the safety of the rocket, because it's not just the safety of the rocket, as we've been saying. It's the safety on the trajectory. So when this rocket, whenever it does, takes off, it's going to launch over. It's going to go over southwest uh, Arnhem Land, so you have to be close in order to see it. Um, if you are not in the vicinity, you won't see it. Um, but look, you've been with us this long on the live stream. You're going to be with us to the end, and I appreciate it. We love you. I love you. Space loves us. And as long as the weather and the wind loves us back, we will see a ro rocket launch tonight. We still do have time in the launch window. Now, there is a limit to this launch window, but we're still in the time of it, so it's fine. We will just wait for those uh, 10 minutes um, before we resume our T minus three countdown. Look, man, when we got to that T minus eight seconds. Oh, we were feeling like it was gonna take off, weren't we? This, uh, this room was electric. We're gonna wait though. So we will wait till we're there. We're still gonna be with you. Now, one of the things that we've explored um, and one of the things that we really have seen with this is how do you build a spaceport in a remote part of Australia. And the history of Equatorial Launch Australia is an amazing one. The history of this vision 
uh, to bring a, um, a, a rocket uh, to here with a contract from NASA ready to go is an amazing story. You know, and I'm surrounded by people in this room that I know have been spending a lot of time on it doing various tasks. And look, they want to go as much as you, probably more than you know, if it's because they've been working for so long to see it and they're waiting for it to happen. <laughs> and we have people who have been standing outside in the rain just the way that there is passion, there is dedication from the entire team here down the launch site and all across it. And this is part of the ethos that has been part of Equatorial Launch Australia uh, and this history to make it happen. And we're going to take a look at it real quick. We're going to take a look at that, of the story of ELA and how we've kind of gotten to today. Look, at this point, if people just want to chime in, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michael Jones, the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive of Equatorial Launch Australia. And tonight, we're doing Australia's first space launch from here in Arnhem Land. So watch this coverage and you will see the first commercial... Sorry, sorry, we were playing the wrong clip real quick. We're going to load the, real, uh, the right clip in a second. Um, People are still waiting for the launch. We have people around the site uh, getting ready to go. Um, again, it does appear that the rain has stopped. Uh, it is the wind. And as some people are noting, it is the wind at higher altitudes. The wind does increase as you get to those higher layers. And the wind, uh, you know, weather is variable. So even if you're in other parts of Arnhem Land uh, or even Nolanboy, the weather may be very different from where we are inland. And that is always the key is you need the weather at the site, at the readiness to do it. And look, uh, we appreciate everyone's patience. We appreciate everyone staying with us. Uh, you know, this is the first commercial launch in Australia. This is the first NASA launch from a commercial space point. And believe it or not, this is our first broadcast of a commercial space launch. Now, we have a dedicated, great team that is working with me who has been tired of listening to me, more almost than you, waiting for this launch to happen. But they are here. We are going to make it happen. And now we do have the clip ready to go of the history of ELA. The company was founded and established in 2015 and has sort of spent the first couple of years determining the best location um, and that's why we are where we are because of the equator which avails us of a whole range of um, astrophysical and orbital options. Um, and then in 2019 we were contracted by NASA who expressed an interest in launching from the Southern Hemisphere and specifically from Equatorial Launch Australia's site in Arnhem Land. Equatorial Launch Australia and NASA uh, go for launch right here in the Northern Territory. These rockets will go some 250 kilometres into the sky to collect data on the physics of the Sun and its relationship with the Earth. It's about sending a message uh, to younger Australians and indeed Australians of any age who might be looking at, at retraining uh, for future careers of how important science is.
And you know what? We're back on count. Yes! So, we are now T minus 140 and counting. So, now as long as those winds stay away, we are going to see this rocket launch. Now, I am no, I am sounding like a bro broken record, but this is okay. We are staying with it. We're going to get this launch. As of now, the winds seem to be as cooperating. And you know what? The beauty of it is a little bit of wind and a little bit of time is dried out our camera downrange. So we are now going to be approaching the 72nd mark. So uh, one minute, 10 seconds uh, left to go. Um, and so as we go, um, we were going to stay at this count. We got to eight seconds last time, and then we had to wait. So we did approach the, the one minute mark. We are still on track. Yep, so we are still counting down. Um, whew, we're getting close. We are getting close to Australia's first commercial rocket launch, NASA's first launch with an Australian customer anywhere. And I can tell when we're getting close because everyone abandons me right at the key time. That's when you know we're ready to go. But there are a few of us here to the bitter end ready to go to see this. Um, we are gonna do it. We're at 30. 20. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go! Yeah! I need a camera, where's my camera? for this all to happen. Um, now, obviously, we cannot see the rocket anymore. Um, that's okay. Um, what we are doing is, uh, let me switch to the other side, set up this one more time. Oh, that was beauty. I felt the building was about to explode when that shockwave came through. Uh, it was a little bit louder than the rain. So, it was a pretty amazing thing. Uh, it was great to see. And so it is, uh, it's a great time to be outside to see it. You can still see the smoke and haze uh, on the pad uh, from that launch. And so we did just have the first commercial launch from Australia and NASA's first launch to it. And look, let me tell you, when you saw that engine kick and it went into the scream, Oh, man, it was a thing of beauty. Uh, it really took off. Uh, it took off with the speed. So it is now traveling in a southwestern trajectory. Uh, so we're outside. Um, we're, we're kind of just outside where we were. The launch pad is down screen. Uh, and so now it's trajectory in that southwest trajectory. Uh, the rocket should now just be approaching uh, about orbit. So when we mean by orbit, I mean the height at which the science instruments will kick on. That's 100 seconds. Uh, now this is when the work of the scientists really have to get going. Uh, there's a lot of work to get their instrument calibrated and ready to go and actually taking that critical data. 
The telescope itself will only be operating for a few minutes, as we heard from Scott and others as part of that launch. Uh, so it's a very short amount of time that they have. Uh, so as it's going, they will be getting the data. They will be getting the information they will need. And then hopefully uh, it's a successful experiment. So the work hasn't stopped. I think that's the thing. As we saw the rocket take off, that's amazing. The work has not stopped. It is still going. We are still here. There are still people active on site, as you can see. The reason there are cars behind us, there are people still active uh, in the mission, in the operation, between the launch site and the command site. There are the science teams working on their data. Now, what will happen is as the scientists collect their data, uh, we have another group of scientists, and these are from Team 2 and the rest of the ELA employees uh, who will be here for the third part, the second and third part of the launch. Now, as this data goes out, uh, the scientists will be collecting their data. Now, this rocket will and the payload will land kind of yonder, way beyond my shoulder, hundreds of kilometers behind, uh, and tomorrow morning it will be recovered. So, you know, the work hasn't stopped. The work has now just begun. That is the important thing about this launch. As the work happens, as we keep going, they will be collecting data. They will be getting their science. They have to collect the instrument tomorrow. Now, as we heard from Kevin, once you collect your instrument, you have to take it back to the lab. You're there going to check it, make sure it works, make sure everything is kind of operating as planned before they say sign, seal, delivered, and they can take it back to the U.S. Um, now, as we said, there are two more launches. So now we have just witnessed Australia's first commercial launch here from Yolun country at the Arnhem Space Center. We have two more launches to go. Not tonight. There's enough excitement and buzz, and we've waited a long time. The second launch is scheduled for the 4th of July. That is the Sistine mission, an ultraviolet mission that will look at Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to us. We also then have a third mission launching on the 12th of July called um, Deuce that will also look at Alpha Centauri, that nearest star to us besides the sun, but looking in the ultraviolet colors. So these are the very important missions looking at different types of the ultraviolet band, as we heard from Kevin, to measure the properties and composition uh, of that star. So the X-ray team uh, based at the launch control center down the road is still getting their data. They still have minutes work of to do to collect it and come back down. Now, the recovery will not happen tonight. Obviously, we're in the middle of the night now. We have just ticked past midnight local time. Thank you to everyone who has stayed up through this endeavor. Um, we, uh, the helicopter crew and team will go out and recover the mission successfully, uh, hopefully tomorrow, uh, and that will all be handled safely. And this has already been coordinated with the traditional owners, the local landholders, and the emergency services. So any of you who were in the local region and just saw a rocket take off, boy, did you feel a kick, man. That was so powerful as it felt through. You saw the light and just heard the boom. It was, you know, it, you feel it in your body. It was almost a way you can't even describe. And there just generally is an excitement, I think, by this team. You know, as we've been hearing, there has been a work for years to make something like this happen, a huge amount of people to make something like this happen. And they've made it, they've seen it, they've been able to make it successful. And look, we have had a rocket launch takeover. We have had a rocket launch happen. And now, you know, there's kind of almost a sigh of relief to some people. The rocket is done. In fact, NASA's job is done. NASA, well, once that ro rocket is launched, they essentially said, hey, you know, it is good to go. It is the science side. Obviously, there's a payload and recovery and the comp. And that's the... And that is the critical part of Equatorial Launch Australia is they are managing all of this, dealing with it and seeing it. And look, we can watch this rocket vision time and time again. I mean, the fact that we just saw a rocket launch from beautiful Arnhem Land, Yolun country, is an amazing thing. I, you know, there are just people are still standing outside and there's nothing else to see. I think that's the beauty of it. So you were still seeing some of that rocket footage uh, as you're seeing on the screen. Um, and so, you know, it really was that quick, powerful launch as we saw. We got the countdown. We got it. It was amazing to see. Uh, look, I mean, as I said, there are people still standing just almost kind of not quite in awe, but I think appreciation because there is a lot of hard work. There is a lot of science. There's a lot of engineering. And there's a huge team, as we see. I mean, there's quite literally a crowd of a couple of dozen people who have been working on site as part of this launch 
who wanted to come out to see for those final few seconds for it all to happen. And I think this is a real sign. We now have clapping inside, uh, so it does sound like the mission was success from the science side. This is what likes to be counted as when the mission uh, gets its critical data, the science is counted. NASA can say, we have had a successful launch from the Artem Space Center held by Equatorial Launch Australia, the first commercial company to do so in Australia and to do so with NASA. It really is a momentous occasion. It is really great that everyone has been here to enjoy it. Thank you to everyone who's enjoyed us in the stream. We appreciate you lasting with us through this very long endeavor. We were worried about it ourselves. Was it going to happen? Was the wind going to stand away? It is wet everywhere we look, but it's kind of clear right above. It was clear enough. It was perfect enough. The winds were stable enough just for those critical final three minutes for the rocket to take off. That's exactly what we saw. That's exactly what you saw. And now we are done. We have reached this historical moment of the very first rocket launch from Australia. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for staying with us. And we will be with you throughout the day tomorrow to cover what is the results of it. So keep up to date. We will be updating information as it comes to the public via YouTube, social media, and the media. Stay tuned for what is in store for now the beginning of the journey. This isn't the end. This is the start.